It's Monday. Hello, everybody. And it's Jakir. Hello, Jakir. Hello, Andrew. Hello, everyone. <laughs> You're back. I think, I think this is the record for the longest time between part one and part two of anybody we've done. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'll, I'll accept I'm it. I'm just, it's a record, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every record's a good record. So have you been well? You're in a different room than last time. Last time you were in front of your gear. This time you're in front of some records, uh, some Grammy foam, a uh, couple of like upside down looking NS10, but not NS10 things. Oh, yeah, those are little Amphions, yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. So is this, uh, is this, this your... This is my, op my office at the studio. Nice. It looks very, very office-y. It's very well done. And I like <laughs> Kind of Blue and Abbey Road. That's, you know. They're important records. Yeah. Yeah. I've There's just, a, someone was John Cash up there too or something. Oh, nice. And who's in the middle shelf? Is, oh, that's, um, uh, yeah, from the, from the movie thing. That oh, all, Pulp Fiction. Yeah, Pulp Fiction. Yeah. All words escaped me. I had no words at all uh, for a minute. I'm now I'm trying to think of the um, who's the graffiti artist that uh, you made my. Oh, is that blank. a Banksy? Yeah, it's a Banksy. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. A little print of a Banksy. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. I think my favorite Banksy was the one that shredded itself when it was sold. <laughs> Brilliant. That was super cool. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we're not here to talk about Banksy. Though we could, if you want. I mean, we can talk about anything. He's amazing. Right. That's the, leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. A true artist. A true artist. Actually. Yes. Yes. The and there's so much comment within his art that you can take it or leave it, but it's it's pretty amazing. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. And so for those people listening, if you ever can come to Bristol, there's lots and lots of Banksies all over the city. I mean, they're everywhere because he paints everywhere, but Bristol is kind of the home base. And there are a lot of them. But anyway, how are you? I'm good. I'm very good. Good. I'm very good. good. So in part one, we talked about your childhood, your middlehood, your early adulthood. And we basically left off at, uh, well, at a pretty good part of your career following um, Eric down to L.A., working on some big records, getting ready to do things. But we left off right before you started working with Ethan Johns. So yeah. um, we were talking just before we started that Mute Math actually happened just before that. So we could talk a little bit about Mute Math because I know there's some people who would love to hear about Mute Math and they recur. You work with them again a few years later. So if you want to talk about that first and then we'll go on to Ethan. Sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, um, uh, yeah. So after working with Eric in LA and kind of uh, I um i met my wife and she's from nashville monet is a nashville native and um uh because we I, you know i had some friends that i grew up with and went to school with that ended up here in nashville and i said i think i said earlier that i didn't think nashville was a place for me um in my early adulthood when i moved to california to begin with um but uh in visiting my friends and family, I, I I've made a visit to Nashville and I, I met my my current my current my future at the time future wife, um, and um, we uh, so we eventually decided to make home in Nashville and I, I moved here and I made some great friends Vance Powell being one of the early friends that I had here. Uh, there's a great you know great community here so. I started spending more time here because of meeting my wife and um, then uh, moving here, um, I started working for some of the local labels uh, and there was a band signed to uh, EMI called Earthsuit and um, uh, Paul Meany, who uh, he wasn't the singer in Earthsuit, but he was one of the main musical uh, protagonists in the band. I got to sort of they were kind. They were breaking up. The label didn't really know it at the time, um, but I sort of met with the band, and I kind of was getting a sense that it was coming. So I, um, I turned down the opportunity to make the last Earth Suit record, and I actually forget if they even made it. Right. Um, but that started my friendship with Paul Meany. Um, he's, I guess, he was living in down in Louisiana. I think he still does, and um, but he would come up to Nashville. Um, 
because that's where the label was and some of the record making was happening. And that's where I met him and Darren King. Um, and then, so that didn't really pan out, but we had sort of made a connection and they sort of branched off. And after a, a, a little bit of time, they started Mute Math. And um, uh, they had made an EP and I mixed, they had made, kind of made an EP on their own. And I, uh, I mixed the EP for them and that sort of started our relationship. I wish that at the time um, we had been able to, um, I wish I had had more of the kind of opportunity I have in my life now or kind of would have partnered with them a little bit more because they started showing me Mute Math songs before it was even Mute Math. Right. Um, and then um, I mixed the EP for them. Uh, and then uh, a producer here in Nashville is named Ted T. Um, he had the wherewithal to be able to partner with them and they started doing things together. Um, and then so I kind of returned to the Mute Math camp um, as a mixer on their debut album, uh, which was on Ted's Ted's label was Teleprompt, which then got a, a deal with Warner Brothers. But um so then, so, you know, when I first started working with Paul and Darren, it was, uh, they had, you know, completed recorded works and I was mixing an EP when it came to the album and then working with Ted, um, the, the, the process became longer and I was a, a little bit involved in the recording, but mostly what I did is they would get songs worked up to a certain point And then I would come in and I, I'd actually start mixing. Um, but the mixing was really, part of the production process on, on that um, full, that debut full length um, where I would mix and then they would kind of take it as like a, an indicator of direction uh, and sort of pull it apart and then, and, and work on it. And then I'd mix again. And so that was, it was a really cool, uh, a really cool process. And there's a, um, I think probably the, the most known song on that is a song called typical. Mm -hmm. um which is yeah it's just it's just kind of incredible richard dodd ended up mastering it it's a super at the time it was a super loud uh super loud really cool sounding record but it's just because of their approach darren's drumming the sounds and the way samples were put together and just sort of the layered i think part of the way that it was able to be so effectively kind of produced and layered is because i was trying to mix it all along even though it wasn't, it wasn't finished, at, right. you know, you know, so it, it kind of, um, it allowed the sounds to kind of get more solidified and baked in and revised along the way. It was, it was kind of a cool process. I wouldn't want to make every project. I wouldn't want to do that on most projects, but, um, but it was really cool. It was a very cool result. And then they, they also made a very progressive video for, uh, for typical, um, which was shot completely, in reverse. I don't know how, I'm not exactly sure how they did it, but the video is, is acted out and reversed the whole time. It's a pretty incredible video. It's worth a watch. So let me ask you a couple questions about that. So first of all, you're not mixing in the box at that point. Yes, I was. Oh, you were. Okay. So you I could was. just put it to the side and then open it back up and then import whatever it was they'd changed. And so you were being able to pick up where you left off. You weren't like recreating mixes no and we and they were working in logic so i was you know and i i have had um over the last whew, i don't know 20 plus years i have made a handful of records in logic so i was familiar enough with it to be able to you know mix in it um and actually mixing in logic sounded better um way before it sounded decent to mix in in pro tools um, and then like once, once the mix was done, uh, then I basically printed it through analog hardware. Right. So let me ask you another question about that for the, the peeps who are watching this or kind of don't have a huge amount of experience of dealing with the weird fluid elastic situations that can happen like that, where all of a sudden, First of all, you're mixing every song more than once. Second of all, you're almost involved in the production process. How did you deal with that on the business side? Because that's an easy position to put yourself into where it can get resentful and weird instead of being creative and collaborative. Yeah, well, business-wise, <clears throat> I you know at that point, I'd had enough experience to know that I didn't want to work for a fee. I just agreed to work as an engine, you know, in terms of being paid, 
Um, even though a lot of times, as you know, mix engineers, we work at, at per song rate. Yeah. Um, but no, in that case, it just, and it, it wasn't really, it wasn't really hard to sell the idea because of the process that was being proposed. So I just would charge a day rate. Um, but I did, um, uh, I did ask for a small mixing royalty, which I, which I don't think I got actually. Right. Um, just because um, I forget why, what the reason was, but so I just worked on a day rate and I was right. satisfied with that because they were paying, they were paying, they were paying close to my full day rate. And I was like, well, this is, this is going to go on for right. a while. So this will be fine. Yeah. Right. Okay, cool. Cool. It's, it's good to hear that though. Cause it is, it, there are a lot of times you get into a situation you love the band and you want to give more. And then by the end of it, it's like, well, you've given all this extra, but there's nothing to show for it either in terms of credit or money or whatever. So it's good to, it's a good thing to keep that in mind that even if you're doing something that traditionally would be paid per song, it's easy enough just to say, we're going to pay me by the day because yeah. who knows how long this is going to take. And as long as people are cool with that. Great. Yes, actually, that's um, that's also something I, you know, I mentioned Richard Dodd on this project. Uh, that's also something that I observed Richard do when he, I won't name names, but he knew how the how the process would go. That there would be, he's in an analog studio mixing, but he knew that the the um, it was a big budget, so that the studio time would just kind of go on and on and on. And while he's waiting, sometimes two three days to hear mix comments and just leaving the mix up that you know he's being paid by the day versus by right. the song and he, pro he probably made five times the money he would have if he'd given a flat rate so right I was like, yeah <laughs> yeah more power too i can take a guess at what record that might have been i bet you can <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that confirms it right there yeah so <laughs> let's let's move on shall we before we get ourselves in trouble so yes, let's sir. let's talk about ethan johns let's talk about how how you met him how you hooked up with him just talk in general and then we can move on to the kings of leon sure um when I was spending time in LA working with Eric, um, I had also been, you know, I had also started living in Nashville with my wife, Monet and our family. And, um, I would go out to LA and work with Eric. And, um, uh, I had been working with Dennis Herring in, in Mississippi. Right. So Jim Phelan, who managed Dennis Herring and Ethan Johns, um, sort of was starting to hear my name uh because of the work that i'd been doing with dennis and he and he i guess he found out that i was in la working with eric so i, I met with with jim and uh he wanted to introduce me to ethan because he was of the he was sort of of the opinion that um uh you know ethan's incredibly talented incredibly capable but that because of, much of the time ethan is producing engineering and playing on his own records yeah um that he just um it might be a good idea if he found somebody that was a good engineering partner. And um, so Jim uh, had me go by Sunset Sound and, and meet Ethan. Um, and I didn't, you know, I, I did, wasn't really, I mean, I guess nobody would have known at the time, but he was making R Ray LaMontagne's first record. Right. Um, and so I went by, they were in studio three and I went by and just kind of hung out for an hour or so. And, just met Ethan and, and uh, ob observed and just we just chatted and uh, made that connection. So that's sort of that's how that came about. Um, and then um, Ethan got. Uh, he was got an opportunity with to work with Nina Gordon. And um, so he uh, he had me come and help him help him with that. And um, that went that went pretty well. And, you know, we. Uh, it, it took a little while for us to build, well, for me to build trust with him because he's so used to doing everything himself. Um, but uh, we kind of hit it off. And then the second Kings of Leon album kind of came up. And it was, just, you know, there's very interesting dynamics in that whole storyline and, and relationships and so forth and so on. Um, but Ethan wanted the opportunity. And I kind of like, I suggested it might be a good idea too, because we'd become friends and, you know, working together. And I kind of was aware of the, a little bit of the backstory and dynamic of, of that particular project. I said, you know, I, I would love to help you engineer that if you, you know, if you'd like, 
Um, so, um, so that uh, we said, said yes. And I helped, uh, I recorded and sort of co-mixed the second Kings of Leon album, Aha uh, Shake Heartbreak. Right. And because Ethan had made the first one completely on his own, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And now, so, you know, we sh- shouldn't overlook, you know, Angelo Petralia. Um, Angelo, Angelo is, is the, is the guy that sort of, when Caleb and Nathan were um, early in their time in Nashville and they, they were sort of writing songs, you know, they, um, they have had a very musical upbringing and background. They were writing songs as kind of a duo and they were, they were sort of, experimenting with the idea of being kind of writing country songs and being country music duo. Um, and so they were kind of making the writer rounds in Nashville and they uh, had, were placed with Angelo for, for a writing session. And it, and, and it kind of turned into rock and roll music with them. And um, so he was, you know, Angelo is a co-writer on the first record and their musical mentor for sure. He taught Jared how to play bass um, exposed the guys to a lot because they had grown up in a, in a very religious family and they hadn't been exposed to a lot of uh, secular music or just, you know, mainstream music. Right. And so, you know, Angela started started playing them music and educating them in the sort of the history of rock and roll music. And so he was, Angela was, was there for many, many records as a sort of a, a mentor, you know, musically and, and, a, and a friend. Um, so, so there was on that first album there, there was a little bit of territorial stuff going on. And um, so on the second record, I think part of, part of me being there was to sort of help find a balance. Right. Um, to help find a balance. Yeah. And that's what started my relationship with uh, the Kings. That's gotta be, a, I'm just trying to think as for them growing up, being very musical, playing music, writing songs and all of that. But being exposed to this gigantic treasure trove of the music that apparently they're actually really, really drawn to, but what it what it's like to discover that when you're already a skilled musician, as opposed to usually you're hearing that your whole life and it just is part of you and you you learn by playing that stuff, but to come to it late, it's got to be a completely different thing. I think so. I think so. I, um... Yeah, I, I would guess that part of part of what it affords is that because it's all, I mean, obviously a huge amount of music and it's all so new and at their ages is sort of being late teens, you know, early 20s uh, that um, maybe not even early 20s, but uh, that it just really appeals to that age of youth and and that it's all it's like this new shiny thing. And they kind of like, they jumped in with both feet, which is really cool. So that, I think that, you know, they were kind of making a a, a throwback type of reflective rock and roll um, at the, you know, but to them, it was like fresh and new. And so so they weren't really hung up uh, with what maybe a lot of artists might be hung up on growing up with it. You know, they just fully embraced it and went for it in their own style Um, and, you know, they grew up in a Pentecostal, you know, family with a with a revivalist sort of uh, preacher as a father. So they were used to, you know, uh, that that kind of a event show. You know, it's just like trying to get people attracted to the message and the, the event. Um, and that's how they I mean, they participated in church, playing in the band, you know, and and being part of that of that energy. So I think that they took what what the skills that they had and were familiar and kind of pro- that projecting to people to, to draw in a crowd and, and infused it with the new sort of exposure to rock and roll. And that's, I mean, that's part of the reason they were such a, you know, such, such a vital and, uh, and, you know, energized rock group for, for, for there in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and sort of compressing the entire history of that kind of music to the point where it's as if it had all just come out you know yes. yeah exactly yeah totally. so you really cherry pick and you can jump around and you don't worry about who influenced who it's like i like that i like that i like that and just grab it all it's amazing it is it is really is and it it worked out well but we'll let should we just continue the king's thread all the way through then and we can jump back if we're missing some stuff because it's a it's kind of a big deal oh yeah i mean especially for <laughs> me i mean yeah yeah i mean it's 
Uh, you know, it's from, you know, yeah, in terms of my career, it's probably the, 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 the artist, uh, and only by the night albums probably, you know, sold the most, uh, has most notoriety for me and most success. So, um, but, uh, you know, rewind back to that making aha shake heartbreak, some cool things about that, you know, that, uh, to sort of tell would be, um, Ethan had just sort of started to set up a studio for the Nina Gordon album that I worked on. He basically just taken over a, um, a television sound studio, uh, um, in, uh, North Hollywood. And, and so there's this, this big open space. Um, it was almost like a big rehearsal room at like SIR or something. So padded walls and stuff. So they could, so they could film TV in there and have little sets and, and, uh, and enough area for the cameras and all that kind of stuff, but the sound be controlled. So he was setting up his studio in there and his, his dad, Glenn had sent him all of the gear from, I don't remember where the studio was, uh, somewhere in England, but, um, uh, all the gear from that sort of farm studio. So that so Ethan had the sort of wrap around Helios desk there. Right. Uh, it, it wasn't function really functional at the time because it just kind of been created up for a quite long period of time. But he intended on getting that working, and he had some tape machines and just very various pieces of gear. It had um, probably a dozen or so of Glenn's uh, microphones. Um, so so kind of piecing it together. And so we, we kind of set up the studio really to make, uh, Nina's album. And then, um, uh, sort of that sort of transitioned into, um, making that aha shake heartbreak album. But, you know, it's like, he really wanted to, well, on Nina's album, part of the reason I was there is probably because of my pro tool skills and I could bring a pro tools rig. Cause that was the right way to approach that production. Right. Um, but, you know, with the Kings, he kind of wanted to get back to what he normally did, which was record all analog. So we didn't have a recording console that particularly worked. And we had we had rented a small API and a few bits and pieces for Nina's project, but it really wasn't going to be the right situation. So I know I knew um, this guy, Kevin Agunas, who um, what's well, drawing a blank. What's the famous studio in L.A. that? Kevin had recently owned uh, Sound City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ke you know, Kevin had, had you know he hadn't yet bought Sound City, but he's that guy, and he's a huge collector of gear. And I knew that um, I knew that from actually my relationship with Eric, Kevin had placed one of his um, Abbey Road TG consoles in Studio B at Eric's place at barefoot it was the dark side of the moon console so i actually worked on the dark side rewind a little bit to eric's place barefoot for a while the dark side of the moon tg console was in the b studio that belonged to kevin so they had kind of partnered on on that use that so i knew kevin had some cool gear because i'd also worked at his uh home studio um which had like a crazy neve in it like a 8078 i think wow. um but he had a smaller uh, TG console. And I was like, and I knew that it was sitting in storage somewhere. So I asked him how functional it was. And he said, it was pretty good to go. Uh, so we rented that. And then Ethan bought a, um, a 3M uh, type 56, uh, 16 track um, that had just been restored. And he also, one of the things or, or also that uh, the speakers off the Rolling Stones mobile truck, right? Uh, the the Tannoy Towers um, had also been delivered to to Ethan from Glenn um, with, with all that other gear. Um, so we had those set up too, and they only lasted about two days because the 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 speakers in them had gotten kind of brittle. Yeah. And we were cranking them up too loud, uh, getting things set up and kind of busted them, which was, but I did, but, but one cool thing I got to do in setting up, um, setting up that studio, like, you know, that sort of environment was Ethan had a safety of Led Zeppelin one, had a, <laughs> had a safety of, had, had a safety of his dad's mixes. Of course. He and, did. and so I admit, well, actually with, you know, with all this stuff, 
there was a tape library uh, that he'd gotten from the studio as well. So we're talking, you know, I didn't listen. We didn't really listen to much because they probably need, they needed to be prepared better. Um, but, you know, the faces and Eric Clapton and um, the who there's all these tapes up there, you know, the, of, of Glenn's work. Extraordinary. Um, but I got to listen to on those. I'm trying to think what the proper name for those towers Lockwood. They're Lockwood. Speakers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I got to listen to I got to listen to the unmastered version of Led Zeppelin one on those speakers. It was it blew my mind because I, you know, it's like, of course, we've all listened to that album a lot, you know, and I heard I mean, I heard a Wurlitzer part that I'd never heard in there before. It's just it's like, wow, just it was it was one of the most visceral, you know, exhilarating listens. Um, so that was super cool. And we, and then we broke those speakers. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, so we set that, we set that up and, um, uh, the band was, it was all, we were all in that one space and, and all we had, really all we had was the, the TG console, the type 56, 16 track and a couple we had one quarter inch Studer and I think a half inch Studer handful of compressors, um, and a couple spring reverbs. And I had a, um, an Atari two track that I used as tape slap. Um, and I, you know, that, that uh, second Kings of Leon album, Aha uh, Shake Heartbreak was recorded with seven microphones, basically to wow. seven tracks is a bit was a basic track, them all playing together, Caleb singing live. The only, the only vocal that we recut was on the bucket. Um, so they were set up in a semicircle uh, with Caleb facing the other guys um, singing on an SM7 for isolation in that big space. And um, yeah, it was it was awesome. So I you know, so Angelo and Ethan would sit with the band and work on the, you know, work on the performances and and, you know, working as producers. And then I would I was recording it and then Ethan and I mixed it because that desk didn't have automation on it. Ethan and I mixed it uh together you know um him taking one half of the desk me taking the other mixing it off the 16 track to the to the two tracks and the only time that record ever touched digital was when i made safeties to pro tools right uh, it was it was a it was a lot of fun it was just a lot of fun um and really cool and um so that kind of you know that that was how my relationship started with them and so one one interesting thing that happened during all of that is I got there was a big deal made about me getting this FedEx one day, and um, and I knew I knew what it was and I, but I was I'm not really I don't I mean I don't really think I'm much of a bragger I don't um, uh, uh, but it was a Grammy that was showing up that I had that I was receiving for Buddy Guy, um, and so the FedEx came and I knew what it was I just took the box and I just. I didn't, wasn't going to open it in front of everybody. I didn't want to talk about it because to me, it's just like the, the most special thing that you're working on or that you're doing is what, where you are at that moment, what you're doing yeah. with people you're with. You don't want to, I mean, of course people like to hear stories, but, but for me, it's just like, I don't want to take away from what's happening in the moment. Yeah. So I just took the box and I put it under the console and, um, so the guys, I was driving the guys crazy. Like what, what, well, what's in the box, man. It's like, aren't you going to share it? You know, why is it so special? And so I opened it up and I think that that kind of, you know, that definitely kind of left an impression on them because also at that same time, uh, modest mouse, uh, float on was a really big hit on the radio. And I had recently mixed that as well. So it's just like, you know, I had a little bit of a, a cachet with them, I guess, you know, um, uh, so, and our record went really, went really well. I thought, you know, it was very bold in its sound and approach at the time. Uh, it's very, I don't know, primitive and raw. It's not completely primitive and raw, but in a way it kind of is, you know, and, it, and it's, it's bold. I think it's modern music, you know, it's like a modern interpretation of rock and roll, but, um, yeah, it was just a really cool record to make. And, um, so fast forward a little bit more and, I think, I, you know, I want to choose my words carefully, but I wasn't, you know, it's not like, it's not like my relationship. I think kind of what happened is Ethan wanted me to move to LA and I was seriously considering it. And my wife and I 
put a um, uh, we put a house under contract to rent, um, and we went home to our Nashville home, and we got home, and it's just like, man, I'm not sure we want to actually move to LA. Right. Uh, you know, it's like, mm. so we so we said, okay, no, let's break this contract while we still have the window of opportunity to do it. And I called Ethan and said, man, I'm sorry. And, you know, it's like, I, I hate to turn you down or turn this opportunity down because I know, I know, but I, you know, I just, I think this is what I need to do. Um, so not move out there. And I think that that kind of put a little distance between us. Um, I kind of let him down, I guess, but, you know, uh, you know, understandably, but at the same time, you know, I need to do what was best for what I thought for myself. So I think it put a little distance between us. And I, and I think that, me having those cu couple of moments with the band also maybe kind of was a little bit of a wedge. Right. Um, uh, unfortunately, or I, you know, I don't really know how, you know, it's just like these things in this business can be, there's a lot of factors and it's not, you know, it's not like there was any ill will and we, we rem remain friends, but it, I wasn't around. So oddly enough, they're making the third record because of the times in Nashville at Blackbird. Um, but I'm not, I wasn't asked to be part of it. Hmm. Um, but I did go, but I was invited by to go visit and, and I, I went by a, a handful of times and, and just kind of hung out and listened and they were, they were doing really cool stuff. I was really inspired by it and the sound had changed, the songwriting had changed and, um, yeah, it was all very cool. Then after that record, I think, you know, they, they started with Ethan when they were very young, basically teenagers. And they kind of were getting into their twenties, and I think, I think the and the feeling of kind of dad as the producer, if you will, right? They were kind of kind of rebelling against that a little bit, um, and uh, you know they they decided that they weren't going to work with Ethan on the fourth record, the only by the now. Now I should mention again that Angelo is present all the time. You know he's right. He's there for all three of those records up to through because of the times. He's part of uh, only by the night as well. Um, but they called me up and said, you know, Hey, look, we're not going to make this, um, this next record with Ethan. And we want you to come back and, you know, engineer and, and co-produce and, and mix. Would you be into it? And I was, and I was like, well, yeah. And I, and I, and, you know, I had been telling my wife Monet that, you know, it's, I think this band has huge potential to, to keep growing. And, and I really feel like that they were arguably one of the best rock bands of the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that, and I really get them musically. And I feel like what, what we do together in the studio kind of, it just has this chemistry that works. So I was just like, well, I'm not around on this third record. Uh, but you know, if I ever get the, I really hope that I, there's some way somehow that I get an opportunity to work with them again in the future. Cause I really feel like, it, you know, it, there's an opportunity there. And, um, so only by the night, you know, kind of, you know, came along and, um, I just really saw it as a, a huge, yeah, just a huge opportunity for me with, with a band that I had experience with and that I felt like, uh, I had an understanding with and that we could, and, and they were, they were very self-assured and, and able to execute and really great. So, uh, it just played into the things that I really like to do uh, in the studio. It's just like get, you know, just get great sounds and great performances and just kind of go for it and be committed. And and I think that we had worked on an album successfully that we basically had recorded live to seven tracks and then made a few overdubs on, um, you know, Aha Shake, Heartbreak. No song was more than 12 tracks when it was finished, you know. Wow. So it's it just just kind of cool go for it let's you know let's record and then it's done you know kind of vibe so yeah only by the night was a was an amazing amazing opportunity and did you did you cut it pretty much the same way no no that's well, no. that's what i wanted to ask about because of course yeah. they've only made records with ethan who only makes records in some version of that mm -hmm. no um they they were and they had they had started to feel restricted by that, you know, and they wanted to. So their friends and contemporaries are using Pro Tools a lot more and uh, overdubbing more 
uh, different sounds, some programming stuff. They just kind of wanted to stretch, you know, spread their wings. And of course, you know, uh, I think uh, fully able and excited to do that. Um, and I think, I think they had a sense of that. And, um, so I think that's one of the reasons that they want, wanted me back. And they also, they reminded me of that Grammy that had showed up and there's like, <laughs> that was part of it. Like, we want to, we want Grammys. And like, well, I hate to hear that in a conversation in the studio um, because that assumes a very rare opportunity that you're not really in control of. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, it's a goal. Certainly it should be a goal in the back of our minds yeah. to, for that, you- that kind of a success, but it's not really for me. If you focus on that, you've already lost your way. It's you don't really ever about- want to make a decision based on that. No, yeah. you need to make a. You need to just focus on making the record and the music the absolute best it, that it possibly can be, um, and then if you do that, then you have an opportunity for that. It doesn't, you know, but nothing is assured. Um, but uh, you know, but I kind of t- at that point I was able. I had a different attitude about it, and um, uh, I kind of took it as a. It's like, yeah, I want that too. You know, kind of, kind of took it a little bit more of a, of a, a challenge, um, and um, sort of losing the thread of my thoughts there. But uh, it's just how how you made the record, you know, and how yeah. it was different from the previous well, ones. Well, the so one thing, so one the biggest thing to me, in uh, you know, I Caleb's an incredible singer. We all know that, um, but. You know, early on, he's a, and he's a wonderful, very poetic, uh, interesting lyric writer. Um, not always, not always the you know, some of it, some of it's yeah, but whatever. Some of it can be, or especially early on, a little bit immature. But that's but that's okay. That's rock and roll. That is that is the sort of the youthful energy of rock and roll. Um, but you know, because basically he was always singing live on the first three records. Um, and he was kind of trying to hide some of the lyrics. He didn't really sing clearly in some ways. It was a little bit kind of mush mouth. And so, uh, uh, and he also was trying to, I think he was also trying to navigate the opportunity that he wasn't going to get to re-sing it. I mean, it was basically, he was singing it live. So uh, to me, the, one of the biggest goals on Only By The Night was we need to um, showcase how great of a singer I know you are. And, and the lyrics that he was writing, I thought were, you know, another next level for him. And I thought, well, you know, the thing that the, for me, what's I mean, okay. Yeah. I mean, let's expand the production process. Let's get into overdubs. Let's, let's put more microphones on things. Let's be experimental. Um, but my, my personal goal was we need to show the world how great of a singer Caleb is. And how cool these songs are, not just not just cool for cool sake, but like that, you know, there's there's a richness to them. And um, so kind of talked about that a little bit. But, you, you know, it's like I always had to be careful about saying too much because sometimes things were misinterpreted or um, if there was a disagreement between the brothers. So it's three brothers and a cousin. If there was a disagreement between two brothers about a, a particular subject um, and you felt like you needed to kind of get involved for there to be progress instead of a stalemate, you know, sometimes maybe you disagree with them both and you just, you know, it's just like, Hey, can we just drop this? This is not important. But, but sometimes if you agreed with somebody, especially if it was a creative decision and you kind of tactfully tried to support that idea, you immediately were an enemy of the family. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like, they were arguing and if you sided with one suddenly they team up on you and they were yeah. mad at you for for being against their family so it's, a tr- it's kind of tricky um but uh having caleb sing the song multiple times there's there's a couple live vocals on um only by the night i i know that uh cold desert is one specifically um but most of them were sung either soon after the same day typically it was the next day that we got the the basic track for a song and he'd sing it two three four times you know every time was a 
killer performance. And then I'd comp what was the sort of was the best. Um, and uh, I don't ever remember fixing or punching anything in on a comp. It was like right. that, right. you know, that was typically, that was typically it. I don't ever remember being asked to change anything either. Um, it's interesting. The very first song that we recorded and I did this kind of by design, not more out of intuition than anything um, was use somebody. Cause I felt like it, I felt like it was such a, it was a unique song for them. Really fantastic song, but it was unique for them in that. Uh, it was almost like a great ballad in a way. It's like this really powerful song, which was not very typical of, of them. And the song is really about um, it's an apology. It's it, Caleb is apologizing. It was basically written as a band at a sound check because um, they'd gotten into a bad fight, you know, a little bit too much alcohol. And Caleb was apologizing to his brothers and the family um, with th that song and when he showed it to them. And so it just had a kind of a different tone to it and uh, kind of came from a different place, I guess. Um, and so I was aware of that and I wanted to record it first because in working with them in the past, I, I knew that once we got into the record or the, the you know, the recording process that the cool things that we were trying to do would start to influence the decision making. And I didn't want that sort of outlier of a song to be um, sort of railroaded or damaged by some sort of idea of progressiveness or cool or creativity, right? Because it really should just kind of should be what it, right. you know, it should have, it should be of the essence that it is. So we did that first. Um, I wanted to do it first to kind of get it out of the way. And uh, I had, uh, Caleb had always sung on an SM7. Um, uh, Ethan had recorded on an SM7 um, and I had recorded him on an SM7 on the second album. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, in my, my goal to really showcase his voice and put it forward, I was like, I'm gonna try a better, I'm gonna try a better mic. So I put up a 251 um, and it was a huge mistake because it, the, I mean, the top end on that mic is so open and can be so aggressive, especially on Caleb's voice has a very, uh, aggressive sort of top end and, uh, syllabus to it, you right. know? Um, so I, I recorded it and that's, I mean, and, and in the end, that's what we hear is that vote. That is the only vocal on the album that has that microphone on it, but it was a pain in the butt to mix. And, and I, I could tell once I got a couple more songs in and I, I was like, you know, I kind of like, well, this isn't the right mic after recording that. So I switched to the SM7 because I knew that it worked and it's, you know, sounded great. It was very difficult to mix. Um, I even, um, I even used a uh, lo-fi plugin on it in the mix to kind of try to manage some of the top end. Right. Uh, um, and uh, so if, maybe a week into the process, I was like, Hey, Caleb, man, it's a killer vo vocal that we have on you somebody. Um, but yeah, I think I, I think I picked the wrong mic. Would you, how do you, how would you, how would you feel about singing it again? Now here's a guy that's an incredible singer and like, just always just knocks stuff out. Right. So I was yeah. like, I didn't think it'd be a big deal. He was so offended that I asked him about the possibility of re-singing. He didn't even hear that. It's like, I have, I feel like I made a stupid technical choice, you know, and I think it would, I think it would sound better if you were willing to give it another shot. Now, of course, you know, if we don't top that performance, I can accept it and I'll make it work. But Hey, he was, he didn't even hear that. It was just like, it was like, well, what do you don't like the vocal? It's like, what, what's wrong with it? And I'm like, Oh no, no, dude, I'm sorry. You know? Um, uh, so that was, you know, that was uh, kind of an interesting sort of little, uh, moment in that process. And it was real, it was just a really, really hard sound to manage, but, um, you know, working in studio D the, the chamber, have you ever recorded in there, Andrew? No, I know you No, the chamber in there is what really makes that space so special. Um, and, you know, I utilize it very heavily on, on drums and overdubs, um, on you, somebody, the, I can't remember the melody off the top of my head, but the OOO vocals that are in the, in the intro and stuff, those were recorded primarily in the chamber, right? you know? And so, 
just a, a very unique, cool texture that it gave so many elements of the record. And, you know, another thing that it was really, it's really cool about that, that studio, that space, that band, uh, and that approach is that, um, their music, like there's not a lot of layers to it. It really is basically the four primary instruments and some, and voices. There's, I mean, there's some keyboard, there's some, there's some accoutrement, but it's very simple. You know, there's, there's a lot of space in it. Uh, there's a lot of space in the music and they're really good about giving each other the spotlight, handing it off musically part wise um, and then pl and playing off of each other, but they're, they're also super competitive. So it's just like, okay, fine. It's, you know, it's the, it's Nathan's turn on the drums to play something cool. Right. And we'll kind of get a little bit out of the way so he can have his moment, but then it's just like, then it, when it's the next guy's turn to have their moment, it, it, so it's just like this, it's like jab, you know, it's like these jabs. Um, so it, it's an opportunity in that way. It was a real opportunity to make each of them sound really important you know, and create these, this like depth of space and use things like the chamber and uh, printed effects. I had, um, I probably had eight, eight or 10 different effects up on the desk while I was recording so that because things happen so fast with them, you are basically recording the band live um, that, you know, it's like, I want to, well, it's like, okay, well, let's use, let's use the chamber as an echo chamber on this song. We'll shut the door. We'll not use it for the drums. I'm going to put the guitar in there as an echo chamber. So I got that effect on this. I'm going to put a, maybe a little bit of delay on the bass. I'm going to use the Cooper time cube on the other guitar, um, do something weird and kind of cool with the drums. But I'd be doing that as I'm recording uh, and, and running the effects live. So I'm recording the band to tape through Pro Tools so that, you know, the, 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 uh, the band's performance is being printed on the tape. I'm also capturing the, the, the pass through input to Pro Tools as a safety. And then once we have the recording, then I'm transferring what's on tape into the computer. Um, and once I, once I make that transfer from tape into the computer. Once we know we have the the take we want to pull off the tape, I'm also printing all those effects right uh, into the Pro Tools session. So it's just all just kind of baked in, um, and uh, you know, so right away, I have half of my sort of treatment and effects done as part of the recording process. Um, and I sort of I thought that uh, I was going to be. I thought that I was going to be going back and forth between Pro Tools and tape a lot more. I envisioned that um, in the end, I'd probably mix it off tape, but then also during Use Somebody, um, Use Somebody is a composite of th three takes. And um, so that's, so that first song we record, uh, doing it on tape. <clears throat> so the master is on tape all the pieces. So I'm actually doing tape edits for the, for you, somebody on the multi-track and I could tell just like, I mean, and you know, it, it takes a second. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, Cause you've got to be careful. <laughs> you got to be careful. You don't want to screw it up. Um, there's only so much damage control that you can do. So you got to be careful. You got to kick everybody out of the room because you know, it's just like, you need to focus. And um, it's just, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of management. Um, and uh, I could just tell uh, making those tape edits that, cause it took me about an hour and a half, I guess an hour something like that i was like i could tell everybody was getting bored and irritated right uh and i was like okay well i'm gonna from now on i'm just we're just gonna transfer the things in off the tape and i'll do the edits and i'll do the edits and protocols much faster so I slowly just sort of got away from the idea that i was gonna preserve the, the uh the whole album on the multi-track tape um and then so that kind of things sort of started speeding up a little bit um it's just you know, it's just a very interesting, just a very interesting process. I, we recorded, I was recording at 96K. I, uh, I was recording 96K because in my tests, that was the, that was the, um, the sample rate that went back to the tape and sounded the most like the original, you know, once it was back on tape and listening to it. Um, but I don't, but I also discovered on that album that I don't like mixing in the box at 96k um uh or in well no actually at the time excuse me that's not correct i don't like mixing i didn't like mixing in hybrid 
at 96 K because it, it's, um, especially when you get to overdubs and you're not, cause we, when we went to overdubs, we weren't going through the tape machine. It was just, uh, it's just the, for analog gear, the 96 K is just kind of like weird headroom to me. It like, it pushes gear in a way that it's not meant to be pushed because you don't have the tape roll off and the high frequencies. It's just kind of a different thing. Right. Um, I, I much personally prefer to be at 48 K if I'm in the box. Um, so, you know, working at 96 K start to mix, realizing that, you know, and doing some comparisons and liking the 48 much better. So I have to, so I have to down sample the whole record to 48 to mix it at my, I eventually ended up mixing it in my basement. Um, and, um, but then, so I'm, I'm recording the original tracks at 96 K I down sample to 48 to mix. And then I'm printing to a second Pro Tools rig and I printed it at 88 too. So was, <laughs> <laughs> just because it's all, it's all what all sounded best. But right. it, was a, it was kind of a lot of work. It was kind of a bit of a nightmare. Man. So did he have to make any adjustments having to sing as overdubs? Because he'd never done it before, right? Not, I mean... No, that guy is a, I mean, that guy is a born performer. No, maybe just was like. Didn't even need to hold the guitar like nothing. Just no. off we go. No, no he'd just go into the vocal booth and just, I mean, it's like literally he was on stage in front of 25,000 people. Wow. It's just like, I mean, just like he just so worked up. I mean, I saw him beat his chest a couple of times, you know, it's just like, no, he just goes in there. No warm up. Just is like, and just gives it. It's, it's insane. It's insane. I've had the privilege to work with many, many great singers. Um, and he being me, he being definitely one of them. It's just, it's just kind of amazing how they can just turn it on yeah. and do it and do it. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that, that's because you'd think there'd be an adjustment, you know, having never done that before. It, there, but, that there, that's, I mean, that's how that they're, they're really surprising in that way that they, I don't know. They just, they've just adapted to it. I don't know. It just kind of comes very naturally to them. It's pretty, pretty wild. Right. I mean, I mean, I had had one experience with him re-singing the bucket on the second album. Um, but, you know, I think, I think, you know, he was used to singing on headphones and doing overdubs. So I guess it right. wasn't really a big thing to him. Well, it just, it sounds like the, because a lot of bands, they get into the studio and everything's different and it, like they're, they're different than they are live. And it just sounds like these guys are the same, no matter what, doesn't matter where they are. It's pretty much the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Man. So, all right, you got to talk about Sex on Fire because when I took my notes for this interview, it was at 647 million streams, but it's probably over 700, 700 million streams right now. So, you know. Wow. It's a lot. It's a lot, yeah, totally. <laughs> and that's just Spotify, you know. I mean, I'm I'm not aggregating from all the different places. So, as everybody will always ask this question, and every once in a while the answer is yes. Did you know with that song that that this could be like the real kind of breakout thing? Not in not in the way that it not in the way that it kind of came out to be in the world. No. Um, uh, in the same way, I didn't think that, you know, it's like, you don't sit there thinking like, oh yeah, you, somebody's going to win record of the year. It's, it's like, I know this is special. This is really cool. What's interesting about sex on fire. It's kind of like almost an opposite of you, somebody where I thought, you know, you, somebody's it's a little bit of an outlier. Got to be careful with this one. Sex on fire was very bold for, from the beginning. Um, but Caleb was honestly, he was a bit, ashamed of maybe not the right word. He was a little bit shy about the sex on fire lyric. Um, and he, in rehearsal, he was even like, everybody's like, come on, let's play that song. Let's play that song. Cause it's exciting. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and uh, even, even when we got to this, even when we're in the studio, he's like, ah, oh, you guys really, he's like, I don't know about that song. He's just kind of like, I don't know. It's like, I think it's just cause he wasn't comfortable with it. Um but everybody's like, no, man, that's that that writ, that just feels like something. So we gotta we gotta record that. So um, we we uh, so no to answer the question, no, we I knew that it was a like a really fun, energetic, catchy tune, um, 
and and there's a part about it that that I'll get to in a minute that I think is very very key in its success. Um, a, a compelling song, a compelling vocal performance for sure. Uh, and what's interesting is that once we got it down, Caleb was still trying to convince me and and the, and the rest of us that um, he just was trying to hide that vocal. He's like, can't the first chorus just be instrumental? He's just like, can't we just take the vocal out of there? Like, no, we can't take the vocal out of there. Are you crazy? Um, uh, so, but that one song has kind of a, I don't, I guess most people well, I guess if you know about the song, maybe you know this, that there's a programmed element to it too. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the drum beat, the drum beat that Nathan plays is really only kind of half time of what you hear. Uh, and, and Matt had this Casio keyboard that he had become, and Matt's the lead guitar player that Matt was kind of obsessed with. And he'd brought to the session and there were these drum samples on there um, that he kept playing this accompanying beat to sex on fire and every time he'd do it nathan would get so pissed and it's just like oh you know no he's like and and um so maybe the second or third time that that matt was trying to get get this idea out and it's like hey can we just try this nathan nathan left and i'm like come on man let's just record it because you know i was like let's just record it and um so he and he's playing it because we're not we didn't record any song on that album with a click so it's not something that you could kind of like loop in there or program in there. I was like, Hey man, just play what, play that part, play it the way you feel it. Right. Um, and he did, and we got about two thirds of the way through the song. And there's some things that happen in the drums that are kind of hard to follow in terms of the pattern that he has, had established. And we were, of course, we were nervous that Nathan was going to come back in and yell at us. Um, so, so I recorded it real fast and, um, so we had this accompanying uh, rhythm programming. We played rhythm to it, and uh, but uh, Beat Detective wasn't really helping to make it work with the track. And also, it had to be adjusted to play phrases that were compatible with what Nathan's performance was. Uh, so literally, I think I sat around. I uh, sat around. Well, I took it home. And I sat around for like two days to to map it out so that the part was compatible with Nathan's performance. And that also that it felt really, cause I didn't adjust. I mean, sometimes I would fix their parts a little bit, you know, it's like somebody's a little early, a little later, there's a, a bum note or something. Uh, you know, I would adjust little tiny things, but I wasn't like correcting anything to a grid or anything like that. So I had to basically, I created a grid with beat detective and it was helpful in kind of knowing where the bars and, and subdivision were, but I basically had to work on it and put it all, you know, place it all by hand and just repeated listening to kind of make, you know, to get it to sit the way that it did. And that's a huge part of the chemistry and excitement of that song because it just, it's just kind of full on from the beginning. Yeah. Um, we convinced, we, you know, we eventually convinced uh, Caleb to keep the vocal in there. He was always trying to get me to turn the vocals down, especially on that song. Um, and now it just kind of, yeah, I mean, it just kind of became, I don't, you know, it wasn't, and nothing was premeditated about it, or um, we just kind of went with inspiration and something that we thought was great. That's all there is to it, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's funny how much, like, because you assume that, like, oh, the band would be excited about that, but the fact that you're actually fighting just to keep all the elements in there. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I mean, you know, a little uh, sto side story about, um, use somebody is the guys were not confident about um, the the background vocal part that's in the intro. Uh, they were concerned that you know that uh, having to come to start the song and come in vocally that that they were a little bit nervous that that might be a bit of a challenge in the live setting. Right. And and they're they're you know like I, we think we should take those out of there. And the big intro, I'm like, no, we can't. That's like a huge hook. I'm just like, so I turn, I turn them off. And I'm like, the intro sounds boring. It like it's too long. It's just it's like, that's the sauce. We can't take that out of there. Um, and uh, 
And they, we, we fought about that a lot. And they even came, that's, I think, I'm pretty sure that's the reason they showed up at mastering is they, they were, they knew they were, they were aware enough to know that, of course, I'm also printing instrumental versions of the songs for mastering, right? right? That, that we could cut the instrumental on to the beginning of the song and mastering, and they could still get what they're asking for. And, you know, we didn't have a fight. We kind of had a little bit of a, you know, you know we had some words uh, and they left mastering. And, you know, I, I made sure that they stayed, made sure they stayed in there. And, you know, I think... I don't like to be adversarial in the studio. I mean, sometimes you have to, sometimes you have to say things that are truthful and challenging, right. You know, to kind of get, to be, to get a great result, but I'm not a person that is, you know, some people have methods of where it's very confrontational. They want to create tension. They want to have heightened emotions and sort of, it sort of be this invigorated, you know, sort of situation in that, in on those terms. And that's not me at all. It's like, you know, let's just just work hard and let's just be truthful and dig deep. Um, But with those guys, I mean, we, yeah, we did, we did kind of fight a lot. Um, And I think over time and all these things I'm sharing, I think is what kind of in the same way that Ethan with them having that, they sort of viewed him as like this father, dominant father figure. It sort of slowly started to erode my relationship with them. Right. But I felt, but I felt like that that's what, that's what I had to do to, to sort of stand my ground and do what I believed in. Um, and, uh, but yeah, another, not a, not a clue. I, I knew it was, I knew that it was an exciting song, but, uh, for it to have done what it's done, it's just pretty wild. That's really it's amazing. Pretty wild. And it's also because I know you're, you know, you're very empathetic with the artists you work with, and you're aware that it is their record and stuff. But the, to have the conviction to stand up for what you know is right for the record for yourself. I mean, obviously nobody knows anything, but but to really fight the the whole band that way with you know not necessarily any allies. It's not like half the band's pulling for what you want. So. That's um... sometimes, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's just like, um, I think I, I do th- the, you know, the, the background vocals in the, in the beginning of you, somebody, I, th- I think that would probably be the one thing that where it's like, I just really had to stand my ground on that. But, you know, it's just like, but I, you know, it's like, I'm not often in those situations where it's like, I felt like a decision, you know, couldn't be talked about in a way that, you know, couldn't find some sort of reasonable agreement on something i felt like that if we did that it was really going to kind of ruin the song right right and good on you (laughs) well yeah i mean but you know it's just like i can take i can take a little bit of credit you know i can take a little bit of credit i mean it's credit is due to angelo and the band just you know every everyone involved because i mean you know we really did it all together so you know it's yeah 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 but but decisions like that especially especially things like you know being embarrassed about the lyric possibly and stuff like that and having to i mean he's the one who's got to live with it the rest of his career Mm -hmm. and to to stick with it and know that it's important is it's a big deal yeah it uh i would let them make i would let them make rough mixes sometimes just just because just instead of them having having them over my shoulder because basically is is kind of that classic thing of all any individual wanted was to hear themselves louder. Right. So I would just turn them loose on the console and basically they're each individually turning themselves up and it just like, just kind of eventually just turn into a, you know, a mess. <laughs> this is like, okay, can I fix it now? <laughs> uh, well, that's good. It's a good way to prove it to them. So awesome. Well, that, that is some good Kings of Leon knowledge you've been dropping there. That Okay. That's a really great thing, but obviously you weren't only working on their records for that span of years. There was a bunch of other stuff going on. And so also up front, I'm just trying to, to get the timeline in order here. When you started uh, with Ethan, uh, with Kings of Leon on the second record, you mm-hmm. also still had a place in the Bay Area as well. That's when you still had all three places going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I had- <laughs> go on. Well, uh, what were you going to say? What's the sort of the B part of the question? Yes, I did. Well, just just so I, I want to get the sort of the because you went from having 
a place in all three places. So Bay Area, L.A., Nashville, to then to saying like, man, we're not even going to rent a house in in L.A. Like that's not going to happen. We're full time. So but in the meantime, you're working in L.A. quite a bit. But obviously, Mm -hmm. did you just pull out of the Bay Area because you just weren't working up there? Or was it something you felt was going on with the scene itself up there? Like what what happened with that? Uh, Well, I mean, it's it was a few different things. I mean, also, you know, it's at the so my time was wrapping up in the Bay Area. Like I started spending time, a lot of time uh, down in L.A. in due part to Eric moving down there from the Bay Area. Um, in the like 98, nine, 98, I guess, 99. So yeah, 98. So the end of the end of the nineties. And, and that's also, you know, the Bay area is a huge, that's like when dot com was booming. Right. And the landscape, like the real estate and just the sort of the landscape of San Francisco was changing um, with all of that tech growth and the internet exploding at that time, uh, things were becoming more expensive um, uh, companies, uh, were sucking up real estate and, uh, kicking out basically some music venues were shutting down, uh, rehearsal spaces were being sold to dot-com ventures. Um, uh, you know, and so the, so the, the music scene was being impacted by that, that boom and it was changing the sort of the, the just the, the vibe and the landscape of San Francisco. So it was kind of, um, there was a very big rehearsal space. I don't know how many rooms it had. And there was a lot of people living there illegally too. Um, but uh, in, in south, south of, not quite south San Francisco, but like down near Army and sort of south of the city, south of the Mission District, there was this huge, uh, I don't even remember what it was called, rehearsal space, but it got, it got sold and everybody got kicked out um, and no place to go really because of how competitive all the real estate was. And um, lots of, lots of my friends and bands, they, they were going back to the states they'd come from, but a lot of them were also just moving down to LA. And that, this is also the t- time where I met Monet um, and had started spending a, a little bit of time in Nashville. Um, and I was just feeling like my time in San Francisco was kind of coming to an end. Right. Um, uh, I loved being there. And I was, I mean, so much of my career was impacted and informed by my time there. But, you know, here I'm getting to my early 30s and it's kind of like, I don't know, it just feels like that part of my life is wrapping up. Right. And so, uh, but I'm only spending kind of part time down in L.A. Well, we uh, talked we talked last time about how when you first went to L.A. and ended up in the Bay Area, how you just didn't like it. And you didn't, uh-huh. you know, you went by as many of the studios as you could, but you couldn't even get in to the parking lot at Sunset. So, right. but when you move back down there, you're at Eric's studio, you're at a soundstage that Ethan built. I mean, did you ever even really work in a lot of the big studios at that point when you first got down there or were you, you avoiding those completely? No, I mean, I, a little bit here and there, you know, I would go to, you know, cause I'd have gigs on the side, you know, just different, different opportunities. Um, no, I actually come to think of it. I spent the most of the sort of more known studios in LA that, that I eventually worked in was after I had sort of moved full time to Nashville. Right. So, um, so no, I was, but, but I was becoming more familiar and, uh, and, you know, having some affection for Los Angeles and, and because, you know, because I had grown friendships there, I had become familiar with the, you know, what I liked and where I liked, um, and just, you know, spending the time there. And, um, uh, but I hadn't, but I hadn't given up my place in San Francisco because I had, I had pretty good rent up there. Cause it's rent. It was a, I don't know if it still is, but a rent controlled city. Right. Um, I, I had a, a roommate, um, who is actually now, you know, he's, he, he's one of the, he's one of the ones that was displaced and moved down to LA and he's still down there. His name's Mark Reitman. He goes by DJ ill media. Um, he was, he was a, a, a DJ, um, and, uh, he had, um, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the band, but, uh, but, um, you know, so I had, you know, so I still was very established in San Francisco and I, you know, I just had a ton of stuff and it was just easier 
to pay my rent and just kind of keep my, my foot there while I was figuring out what it was I was doing. Um, and, uh, you know, as I was feeling like I was making the commitment to move from San Francisco down to LA, um, I was maintaining an apartment in both. And then, you know, my life, Monet comes into my life and sort of that's, that's part of my life starts to happen. And it feels like, okay, well, we need, you know, we need a home there perhaps too. You know, I it was like I was very unsure about where I was going to end up because I had actually also started making records in Nashville. Right. Uh, because uh, very soon after I met Monet, um, I got a call to make a record with this band Switchfoot. Now, they're a San Diego based band, California based band, but they were signed to a, a label out of Nashville originally. And so um and the album I was asked to uh, work on, I was I was asked to produce half of the album and mix the whole album. And Charlie Peacock was the other producer. Charlie's, you know, Nashville based um, producer, record maker. Um, so it's like, well, it just makes sense for us all to make the record in Nashville. So I started spending and it was also like I get to spend time with this, you know, my my uh, my in my new relationship uh, by by being there. So I was kind of very unsure about it all and and uh san francisco was the place that i gave up first right and and moved all my stuff down to la and and got a, a bigger apartment because i thought monet was going we we were thinking okay well we're going to get rid of our apartment in nashville and she's going to come to la and then uh that didn't you know that didn't happen that's kind of well so i told you about when i um when I sort of declined to move out to LA full time to work with Ethan prior to that, I'd sort of decline. I ended up declining a similar offer with Eric. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, he had graciously offered to let me take over the studio B at bare at barefoot, um, and continue to work with him, but then also have my own room and do my own things. Um, and sort of just as I was about to pull the trigger on that, it's just like, it just doesn't feel right. I, I feel like, for my family, for my life decision making, I I think Nashville, even though I'm going to travel a lot to work, right. uh, it's just like we can afford to have the kind of family life that I would like to have in Nashville. And I was making friends like Vance and Richard and uh, Richie Biggs and Charlie Peacock and all the, you know these various various people. I was like, well, I mean, I feel like I could I feel like I could work there too. Um, so eventually that we, you know, we made home in Nashville and, and temporary, you know, at, at the time with Ethan kind of thought about giving, we owned a home at that time with, when I was cons considered, we were considering selling that home or renting it out and then renting the place in LA to work with Ethan. And I sort of backed out of that decision too. Um, they're tough decisions. You know, this, you don't get a lot of opportunities in this career and it, you know, you probably should say yes to most of them. Um, but, uh, you know, I just had to sort of look at the balance of things and, and, um, that, that, you know, the happiness and health of my family I had to put first. And it was a good thing. I mean, it, 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 it turned out to be the right decision. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're, you're obviously very thoughtful. And we talked about last time about how, you know, you're making lots of really long-term decisions, not just the short term. I'm going to go make a record with youth and okay, that'll be great. Um, but it, it's also, I think it's what, like there's a parallel between that and your production style where like you're in the studio and you know what the right thing is and you're convinced it's the right thing and you will follow through and make sure that thing happens. Not like, well, I don't know, they don't like it. So maybe they're right. You know what? Like it, you're, you have convictions that you've put enough thought into to really stick with, which I think is, is pretty admirable and has served well, you well. Thanks, man. I mean, we don't, I mean, I certainly, I mean, I would I appreciate you acknowledging that saying that I'm certainly haven't made all the right decisions. And, um, you know, I don't know that I would really regret anything, but I mean, I think I'm sure things could have been different based on some different decisions, but, you know, just for me, it's the only way I know to be truthful with myself to, you know, at least I, I'm just not very, I'm not very good about, 
putting on airs or playing a role or or pretending to be something I'm not. I think some people are not that that not to say that anyone that is good as that is at that is not genuine. It's just not a skill that I particularly am able to use and manifest something that is of value to me. Right. Uh, so it's just I just don't I don't really know any other way to operate because I'm such a I'm a really emotional person. I only I, I um, sometimes to, sometimes to my detriment. I I just want to address things. I want to talk about things. I you know it's just like I'm okay to have hard conversations, um, just because that's the only way I can. That's the only way I really function. Right. So. I just have to always put myself in a place uh, that I feel like I'm going to be able to be who I am, whether that's the right person for the situation or the right decision. I don't really know because time really has to be the, the, um, to prove the, you know, whether it was the right decision or the answer. Right. But it's just like, I can only control the now I, with, with what is, what I have in mind for the future. I can only, you know, I can only do so much now and I have to sort of kind of keep referring to that and reflecting on that and just be truthful with myself. So I, I you know, it's, it's really, um, it's sort of self-preservation, I guess. Yeah. I but really... I think it's also, you seem to also have the ability to not second guess yourself. Once you've made that decision, it will be the right decision because you're not spending any of your time regretting or wondering, oh, what if, what if, what if? It's like we made that decision and now I'm doing this thing. And that's you can't be successful thinking about the thing you didn't do. So you, you seem to be very good about once the decision is made, you're going to follow through with it and make it make it the right decision, basically. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, there, that I mean, largely, uh, that's the way I operate. Now, it's just, you know, just commit to something and follow through with it what you know and sometimes it you know it'll wear it wears it wears on me you know just because i don't i'm also i don't really um i don't acquiesce very easily not not you know just in terms of what my per like my, my personal motivation and drive and vision is it's like it's not it's like i'm also i'm very agreeable you know, I'm not, I, I try not to be judgmental. I know everybody has a point of view. Everyone's, you know, everything is valid in a way, whether it's, you know, whether I think it's right or wrong or, or however, it's like, I, you know, I want to give everything and everyone the same respect that I kind of would like to have. Right. And so it's, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I just, I just try to, uh, but you know, so I, I'm very, uh, unrelenting you know it's just like i will beat my head against a wall until i pass out or i break the wall <laughs> that's kind of just how i am <laughs> and so far you've broken the wall most of the time most of the time i i, I sometimes i feel like i have a, i go through life with a headache too right <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about the Nashville scene because we talked about like early on, um, I think we both had the exact same feeling. Like Nashville wasn't even an option. We saw it as like, it's country music. That's not what we do. Can't possibly go there. And obviously, even back then, I'm sure it wasn't really the case. But we talk about, you know, Vance and the, uh, Richard Dodd and the other people that, that you immediately fell in with in Nashville. And it's quite a different scene there. I mean, the country scene exists but mm -hmm. there is so much else going on there. And I'm curious, do you feel like you were sort of getting there as that was really taking hold or did it turn out like that was going on the whole time or what was the deal? No, I feel like I, I think I, I think, no, I think I arrived as it was really starting to open up and, you know, and um, yeah, I think I, I you know, I, 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 in some small way, I, I think I had a part in it, you know? Um, and, you know, like, not long after I was here, I mean, it was a few years, I guess, but, you know, Blackbird Studio started to become a reality and, um, you know, just different things the, the industry was changing, you know, like, you know, the, the established studio infrastructure was starting to kind of like break down and change and, um, you know, Berry Hill where um, Blackbird is and where Richard has his studio. There are lots of little studios around there. Um you know, I, I mean, I'm friends with the Kaysen family and, and they uh, Creative Workshop, which uh, is one of the early independent studios in Berry Hill, um, started by Buzz Kaysen. Um, uh, um, 
uh, you know, it's a, it, they, their second creative workshops, second studio, once they became really successful, um, they built a second studio and that's where John started with Blackbird. You know, he, he bought the second creative workshop, uh, and, and, um, yeah, just kind of like, it was just sort of opening up. I mean, having, having Richard Dodd, someone like Richard Dodd there, you know, it's just like, and being connected with those, with those folks. So I don't, I'm not really sure what the, how the puzzle pieces all came together, but it, it, um, it just, uh, it just sort of fell in that way. And there's just, I mean, a lot of people that I met were just very like-minded, you know, and had, had similar life experiences and record-making experiences than me. And, um, but it's all it, it's just a, a good community. Uh, you know, Richard, I, I just really just met him. And I guess, I guess he just had a good feeling about me. He let me mix that. I mean, his studio is kind of a private studio and, you know, he would let, you know, some, some of his friends use the studio, but for whatever reason, Richard um, took a liking to me and let me mix the switchfoot record there. And I, you know, just have barely had met him. Um, but, uh, you know, so he was, he was very accommodating and a friend still is a friend. Um, yeah. And, you know, uh, Vance and, and John starting, um, Blackbird, all those things kind of happening. It, yeah. Just, I think also, I think also I was here for a life decision going to LA a lot, but then I started working with Dennis Herring, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, down in Oxford, Mississippi. Now, it's like a four hour drive, all back roads to, to get down there from Nashville. But um, I started going down there and working with Dennis over a handful of years. And I think that even though that wasn't something that was happening in Nashville, it was something that was happening that I was involved in regionally. Right. And so I think that that also sort of kind of impacted how my profile was working in Nashville. Also the, the record makers, uh, in Nashville at the time when I moved here, um, they, they didn't get a lot of outsiders, you know? And right. so, so me being new and an outsider, I also kind of got a, I got a lot of looks, I guess, you know, I got, I got called for a lot of sessions as the new guy in town. Um, and, and so that was kind of, you know, good exposure, uh, and connection to what was going on, going on here. Right. And but also being because, I mean, there's a very strong tradition of how you make records there. And the yeah. fact that you could show up and be new and not because I've heard some stories about people going to work on records there and just being expected to do it the Nashville way. And mm -hmm. you didn't necessarily need to do that. No, and I, I didn't even know what that I mean, of course, I learned about it. Um, and I have. Yeah, I mean, um I have some experience with it peripherally, I guess a bit. And, you know, you do fall in, I, I have, I wouldn't say that I've adopted a bunch of it, a little bit of it because, you know, things kind of work on a schedule here. You, yeah. When sometimes when you hire those musicians, um, they kind of expect to work on that schedule. So you, you kind of, you sort of shape the schedule around kind of what their normal availability is and sort of their expectations and sort of adapt to it. But I just showed up and did things the way I knew how to do things or the way that I just did things, which was it, which is very California, I think, you right. know, very, very sort of like you go in the studio and it's very much kind of like a rock and roll record making mentality. It's just like you go into the studio for a week to a month, take it over um, and basically live and live, live there and just kind of you just follow the thread of creativity and there isn't really a schedule and you just, you kind of just do it. Right. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I, I guess I brought a little bit of that here for sure. And I just, I've always just sort of done things in, in the way that I do them. Yeah, I guess. And the local musician scene was obviously shifting there too, because all of a sudden these bands are not leaving to go record somewhere else. They're staying in Nashville and, you know, I think Jack White probably had a big hand in keeping some people around town who might have decided to leave and things like that. So it was a good time to show up. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, like Jack Lawrence uh, has made his home here. You know, Jack uh, um, is one of the rock and tours, you know, uh, Dead Weather as well. Um, 
you know, Brendan Benson. I think that, you know, it's like, you know, because uh, Jack Lawrence's band from uh, Ohio, the Green Hornets, you know, it's like Brendan had produced their early stuff. You know, Brendan is moving here, befriending Jack White, you know, pulling Jack Lawrence in uh, on, on the rock and tours record, you know, the rhythm section from the green Hornets, you know, and everybody kind of gravitating towards, you know, here also, um, the black keys and ending up being here. Um, and all the stuff that Dan Auerbach's done. Um, yeah, it's just yeah, for whatever reason, I think just the, the community, uh, I think blackbird had a bit to do with it, you know, cause right. it kind of started, it started to attract a rock and roll, sort of environment a little bit you know while at the same time still do making lots of country records and being part of that normal rotation uh, um, being the sort of world-class studio the collection of gear that john brought to nashville it's just very it's just a very enticing place and you know joe ciccarelli yeah. who's like a yeah uh you know someone that i knew from i, I first assisted joe a long time ago maybe i already talked about this um, in San Francisco, you know, Joe is LA based, but for a long time, you know, for it's probably been, all, but well, anyways, for a number of years, Joe was like always in Nashville working at Blackbird, you know, and he's a very LA guy, yeah. you know, in terms of his, you know, his record making pedigree and, you know, where he is located. Um, just all these things kind of gravitating towards Nashville is, just, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's people, it's young musicians moving here. Um, out of convenience, a community, uh, affordability, facilities. It's just kind of like this perfect storm. And, and I was fortunate to move here at a very good time. It's just, just ahead of it, you know, just ahead of those things happening and contributing however I, however I did. Right. Know? Well, and, I mean, which makes you part of the transition. You know, I'm sure a lot of people came to town and saw you there and like, oh, all right, this can work, you know. That, that, that's true. I mean, I think, I think Ryan... Hewitt, who lives here now, to, like, I think that, you know, having myself and others, you know, that are like minded of a similar age, similar, similar background being here kind of made it like, oh, OK, maybe that works, you know? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, and I think obviously even my work with Kings Leon, those guys being located, you know, here and 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 making that, you know, the, the having those successes. Um, yeah, just sort of solid kind of solidified some things here it's 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 very cool yeah yeah, yeah it was good good stuff being done there as they say i don't, yeah. they don't nobody says that i just said it <laughs> um so i'm sure we've skipped over some stuff but we did we touched on you know mute math who sort of happened in between some uh kings of leon things but there's then not right after kings of leon you got nora jones mm -hmm. so let's talk about that for a minute Okay. Because that's um, a bit of a, it's a bit of a left turn. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, so I think, well, it goes back to Tom Waits' Mule Variations. That's one of Nora's all-time favorite albums. Wow. Um, so, uh, and then, so the, so I get the call from Nora not long after the the success of, uh, you know, that only by the night album. So it's like my profile had risen a little bit. Uh, and it was, you know, I had sort of the credibility uh, of the Tom Waits relationship and with her, you know, and with her that being a favorite album of hers. And then sort of also, you know, different, slightly different style of music, you know, 10 years later, kind of like, you know, having a bit of profile. So, I mean, that helped, as you know, it helps with record label executives and A&R folks. It's like when you've got a hot hand, it's like you get phone calls, you know, like if, if something has, if you've had a couple of successful records that are kind of doing well, it's like you get more phone calls. That's, you know, that's just how it is. Um, uh, so, yeah, she, she sought me out because uh, she wanted to do, you know, something a little bit different from, from what she had been doing. Um, uh, and she wanted to uh, experiment with a lot of different musicians, uh, a lot of different rhythm sections. And I think her knowledge and appreciation of the Mule Variations album sort of said that maybe I was someone that could sort of 
uh, help facilitate that because there was so many, so many musicians on that album and just so it kind of came together in so many different parts and pieces. Um, so yeah, I got, I got that call and, um, obviously a thrill because, you know, I, I love, I love the feeling of her music, her musicality, the, the, the sound of her voice and you know, her, her ability to sing. Um, and, uh, she had, start, she had, she had kind of started the process, um, uh, of, of making what would become the fall, uh, in her, her personal studio in New York. And, um, you know, so some, some of it had started as demos, but the demos were kind of, she was kind of thinking, well, maybe some of these demos can be the records and that, and they're kind of a reasonable assumption because, um, many of the songs on come away with me were recorded in like a one or two day session. Right you know, on her own before, before she got signed and they re-recorded some things, remixed some things, sort of tweaked some production on some things, but, you know, some of those, some of her most famous initial songs, uh, uh, were basically just kind of almost like a demo session. Right. So, um, uh, so I got the call for that. And, um, she also, she also knew of my sort of programming ability, right. But to do, but to do it in kind of like this sort of um, bespoke crafted sort of way, I guess, you know, um, and I uh, got the call for that. And it was, it was interesting, you know, she had, um, gosh, I don't remember how many songs it was. It was quite a lot. And so some had been started and um, trying to figure out scheduling, you know, she had a few different rhythm sections she wanted to work with. She wanted to work with James Gadson. She wanted to work with the the uh, is it the Daptones right rhythm section that had you know because the Amy Winehouse stuff uh, had become very popular and they were they were kind of a hot rhythm section uh, for a while from that and the stuff they'd done with Sharon Jones um, uh, and I had a few you know I had a few players that I wanted to bring into things um, and so it ended up that we had basically five different rhythm sections and a couple dozen additional musicians in uh with that that we wanted to kind of schedule um so honestly it took a lot of it took a lot of time to sort of work through the songs with her and figure out well what can we keep and what should we redo what should we add to or change and then who do we want to play on what songs right and what songs maybe do we want multiple shots at, you know? Uh, and it was a very, it was a very exciting and challenging, fun process. Uh, so I spent a, probably a couple weeks in New York, starting the process with her, just working at her studio, kind of going through things, preparing some programming with a, uh, with a friend that lives here. His name is Matt Stanfield, um, helping me with some of the programming and kind of just putting things together and getting ready while I'm working out the musician schedule to record. Um, and we, we started at um, a studio in New York. Um, it's going to come to me. Oh, the magic shop, mm -hmm. uh, which is this cool, this cool, just kind of hole in the wall studio that like Coldplay had recorded at and a bunch of, a bunch of cool things had happened there, but it was really small, kind of funky, had a fantastic Neve desk in it. Um, but just, just this weird, small, funky little room. So we we spent a couple weeks there and changed out rhythm sections, you know, like James Poyser, who plays with the Roots, came and played keys. And um, like I said, the Daptones came in, some, you know, some of my friends, you know, just, we did, we recorded with James Gadsden when we went out to LA. We went out to LA and worked at um, Sunset Sound in Studio Two for, just a little over a week, just to kind of, because Joey Warnaker, right. um, um, James Gadsden, I just, yeah, I just, I can't remember everybody off the top of my head. That's where I met Zach Ray. Right. Uh, amazing musician, keyboard amazing. player. Yep. Amazing on many levels. Uh, Dave Wilder and um, fantastic bass player, friend of mine. Um, I mean, yeah, it's like, I'm, for, I'm forgetting most of the names off the top of my head, but uh, it was just like this wonderful puzzle piece of putting things together and, and like chasing pirates, um, has, 
in a way has has three different rhythm sections on it because it's really kind of a, a mashup of a few different things. So like I said, we had some I, I, some programming prepared to prepared that we played to, not always. Um, Chasing Pirates was one where, where it had this sort of like backbone of a programming sort of sketch that we played on top of. Um, and uh, we had done the first version of that song very early at our time at the Magic Shop. Um, but I could tell, I, you know, I could tell that Nora wasn't, it's not that she wasn't satisfied with what we did first, but that song was so important to her and she just kind of wanted to explore it with others. Um, so a few days into the, the magic shop sessions, I had a new rhythm section. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we, um, Oh gosh, I'm, uh, my, I'm having a mental block. Uh, it'll come to me. But uh, so we're going to, I know we're going to record Chasing Pirates again. So I'm setting up the night, I'm setting up overnight to, to, for the next day's session. Um, Marco Giannavino, that's uh, played drums. He's played with Robert Plant uh, a bunch. Um, and um, I'm having such a mental block about Frank's last name. Um, but uh, um, I'm going to have to look it up to th because I, the more you try to think about something, the harder it gets to think about it. Um, but uh, we were setting up and we're kind of getting a vibe going for the song. And I was like, well, I know we're going to re-record this guy. So let's let's just kind of get a sound going. And what they started playing was just so incredible. It's like, no, we got to we got to record this, you know. Um, so I just boldly decided to record it without Nora there. Um, and, and sort of show her the song, uh, so show her that version the next day. And, you know, really the Wurlitzer part that she should have been playing because she wasn't there, James Poyser was playing, you know, and, uh, but it just had, you know, it just sounded, it just felt so cool to me. So she came in the next day and I was a little bit nervous, but I was like, I want to, sh I really want to show you this. Um, and, um, uh, uh, she loved it. She loved it. And, um, she's like, well, can I sing on it? And I'm like, well, yeah. yeah. Uh, so she said, she sang, she sang, uh, three takes, you know, and it's, this is, she's also, you know, this is kind of like the Caleb experience. It's like, just, just get in there and sing it. It's amazing. It's just like, well, she sang it the first time. I was like, that sounded amazing. Nora. that was, that was wonderful. Would you, you know, I think let's give it another, give it another, try, you know, she's like, sure. Yeah let's, yeah, let's do it. You know, it's like something to choose from, you know? So she sang it again, stellar. I'm like, let's just sing it one more time. Just so I have one more to come from. And, uh, she sang it down. And I was, and the third take was really good, but that second take was like magic. And I was like, I really like that second take. She's like, yeah, me too. I was like, so should we just keep that one? And she's like, yeah, I was that was it. So and it just, you know, just moments like that. And so like literally the lead vocal on Chasing Pirates, I think we did in like 30 minutes. Right. You know, you know it's just like, and that's, that's not the normal, as you know, you know, getting vocals that fast. Um, yeah. It's just, uh, it was just, a, it's just incredible, you know, it's an incredible time. She's always the best musician in the room. That's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. Uh, but she's so easygoing and just so, just so chill about it all. There's no, there's nothing diva about her, you know. So it's just like she's a, she's a great hang, super talented. Um, it was just a lot of fun. I mean, we recorded that whole album, all those songs, in about three and a half weeks total. Wow, even uh, with all those people. All those people, yeah. It's like literally. I mean, literally, we'd have a rhythm section. Okay, it's going to be these people for these two or three days. And then these musicians are going to like, uh, you know, Smokey Hormel is going to be on guitar for these two days, but we're going to keep this rhythm section for one more day. And, you know, somebody else is going to come in on guitar and then we're going to change and it just kind of keep, you know, just kind of keep it flowing. And it was, uh, it was wild. It was wild, but it, you know, it worked, it worked out. And, you know, so like just to finish the thing about Chasing Pirates, I mentioned like there's three rhythm sections on it. There was the original drum performance that she really was sort of still kind of attached to, which was 
kind of, which was kind of different from the, what the kind of com- combination that we were getting to. Uh, Frank Swart uh, is the bass player on Chasing Pirates. Um, uh, sorry, Frank, if you're listening, I don't know what my problem is. I just like I'm, my brain cells are a little burnt. Um, but um, uh, so I recorded the 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 guy that had played on the demo at her apartment, her apartment studio. She had this amazing uh, studio in her apartment or amazing studio in her apartment in New York um, and sort of infuse that. So it's like the main drum part is Marco, but you get a little bit of the, it's almost like the other drum kits are sort of just treated like percussion, you know? So like just maybe, Oh, I'm only using the overhead of this one performance and I'm it's, Oh, you know, it's kind of like over here, you know? So it's just, it's part of the soup, but it's uh, so it was just, it was just fun to figure out. It was fun to figure out tape. Interesting technical thing is at that time, uh, this is when like the tape factories are kind of closing down and, uh, Mike Spitz, you know, rest in peace, uh, ATR services. Um, he started making tape. Yeah. Um, and, um, I can't forget, I forget who, what other, there was another tape I was using. It wasn't as boutique as what Mike was doing, but, um, but the manufacturing had become really inconsistent. Yeah. And I'm trying to record, nor and these incredible bands to tape and then transfer to Pro Tools in kind of a similar way that I did sort of described on Only by the Night. But I was finding that the, um, you know, sometimes you'd run out of tape, you know, like ta- you keep a few performances sometimes and you'd have to switch reels to keep going. Yeah. But, the, but even the reels that you're being sold as the same batch. Like, totally different totally different. You have to realign the whole machine. It was a nightmare. Um, and so at a certain point I just gave up on trying to record to tape, um, and we're just recording things into the computer at 96 K. And I had to actually spend a little bit more than a week when I, when everything was done and recorded, sort of prepping, um, prepping the, 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 the album to be mixed because I took it home to my basement studio and I was basically running the multi-track off of Pro Tools through my console, through my tape machine, and then printing and then kind of bringing it back into Pro Tools. Um, so it's just to kind of get the sound that I w- that I wanted to get, you know. Um, so that was quite a process. And and also in that late night session where I uh, where Frank was playing bass. Um, his son Izzy had made this, who's his his little his young son. He's not so young anymore. Um, is literally like a genius, um, crazy crazy talented uh, mind. But um, Izzy wanted to. He's like six at the time, and Izzy really wanted this robotics kit that was like very expensive. And and so Frank was like, Frank plays bass through a Marshall. Uh, you know, uh, you know, lead 100. So Frank loves distortion and just a really aggressive sound. So Frank was like, okay, Izzy, tell you what, this is how you can earn some of the money to have the robotics kit. It's like you figure, you design and uh, you design a, a distortion pedal and I'll help you, and I'll help you build them. So I have like number 10 so of Izzy's project of making these distortion pedals so that he can buy the robotics kit. When he was and, uh, six. When he was, oh, I mean, uh, yeah, when he was six. I mean, no, this this kid, like when he's like six and seven years old, he's like talking to like, uh, you know, um, physicists, like university professors, like Oberheim, you know, just wow. like, like massive minds, you know. Uh, he probably could have had a very intelligent conversation with George Massenberg about things that are probably beyond our reach. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah. So on that song on, well, I'm getting this tangential story on that song on chasing pirates. It's like, Hey, we were just setting up having fun. So it's like, Frank was, Frank was like, Hey, check out this pedal Izzy made. So I'm, I'm like, okay, it's this crazy, like, aggressive distortion but he's like what do you think and i'm like well yeah whatever let's go for it (laughs) 
And, but then when I got, to, I got the, I got it home and it's just like, this doesn't really kind of cut it as the base. So I had to reamp that bass part. I mean, it still is very much the sound, but I had to sort of fill it out and give it some body and some weight. Um, Cause we were just very much recording on the fly. So just little projects like that um, after the fact, um, mostly because of the, what was available as tape from yeah, tape at the time. It was just, you know, just a very interesting little aside there, but yeah. it was fant fantastic. I had such a good time making that album. Um, the talent, uh, the talent and personalities and, and all of it was just a, yeah, just a beautiful thing. And we, we had a lot of fun and we, we made a, what I think is a really special record. Yeah. And it's, it's almost the Steely Dan approach of just like, man, who's, who should play this song? It, it's great. Yeah. I didn't, I've never thought of it that way, but yeah. I, uh, I mean, at least what I know from, of the Steely Dan history that, yeah, I've never done anything like that. And I wouldn't, uh, before or after um to that degree but it sure was fun i wouldn't want to do it all the time i mean well, i think you can, you think you can only do it with a like a nora yeah you know i mean how can... often are you putting together bands for people anyway because most of the acts you work with are bands aren't they yeah for the most part um you know it comes in see it comes in seasons i i think i've moved away from uh working with artists that i need to have studio bands for but that you know in large part, but, um, but I'll, but I made a fantastic album earlier this year. That's, uh, with, with, a artist, his name's Michael MacArthur and, you know, put together a, a great band, you know, Aaron Sterling on drums, Eli Beard on bass and Drew Smithers on guitar. And, and then Josh Davis, who's a friend of, uh, of Michael's, uh, on, on, on the second guitar and Elliot Blaufus on keys. And, you know, it's just like, so I do put, but those, but almost, all those guys are kind of my friends. So I don't, even though they are studio musicians and guys for hire and that's what they do every day. I, you know, I don't really quite look at that particular moment as sessions, uh, session right. players. Um, I do it from time to time. Uh, I'm kind of, I guess, moving away from it a little bit. I've started doing, um, so I, I do, I do work for Facebook now where I contribute through their FMI program. It's Facebook Music Initiative. So I basically, I create um, instrumental works of music for that, uh, for that um, project. And um, I have formed what I call the K Club. So, you know, my, all my various friends and collaborators, we just kind of create, and it's not genre specific. We do whatever kind of we feel like. It. Um, uh, so I, I, I am in that way, I am working with, you know, putting musicians together, but um, I guess to answer the question is I have spent a lot of time working with bands, right? Most, mostly, mostly working with bands. And even when I'm, even when I'm selecting, um, you know, session musicians for projects, um, I think about it very much as like, I'm building a band. Right. So, so interpersonal, like how I feel like people's chemistry is not just their music taste ability. It really is like how the chemistry is going to come together and whether I think uh, a certain session musician is going to feel sympathetic to what the artist is doing. Right. Because I don't want somebody to come in and just play a chart yeah. of, of a song. I want them to feel invested and want to get it like, get it right. Like they, they, they they're going to care about the project. And all yeah. the people you've talked about, I mean, they're all, not only will they come in and be sympathetic to the artist, but they're also sympathetic to each other. Like I've gotten to work with Smokey a bunch of times and, and he has a thing. I mean, you can tell, oh man, that's Smokey, but he's such a band guy. He's just listening constantly. And it's all about making sure what he's doing is working with what everybody else is doing. And and that is, that's, that's what a band does, as opposed to just a group of musicians to come in and read a chart. Yeah, it's a very different thing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so I, you know, so yeah, you and I approach it very much the same way. Uh, I, you know, I'm not, um, yeah, I'm not interested in, in the, you know, clock punching, play the chart type of situation at all, because right. the thing is, it's like, I don't really run sessions that way. You know, I'm not, I'm not like, like, okay, here's the demo, play your version of the demo. It's just like, well, here's the demo. Let's, let's, you know, let's take that as a jumping off point and like, let's create something. So let's get involved in 
playing off of each other, feeding off of each other and, and trying to, you know, just, just make it in a different way. You know, it's like, how do we all feel inspired as a group in this moment and, and figure it out with each other? And Hey, what are you playing? Or well, that's a good idea. Well, maybe I have a change. Maybe I should change what I'm doing. So that can shine. Yeah. That type of mentality. Yeah. That's great. And some um, just amazing musicians. I mean, that list, everybody should go back and just pause after each name you said and go look up 10 records they played on and find them. Cause it, it's, yeah. I mean, like you mentioned Zach, who's, I think he's, he's in Death Cab for Cutie now, but I mean, he played yeah. on so many records leading up to that and is such a great musician, had a really cool studio in LA for a while too. Uh, might still have it. I don't know. I haven't no, you it. know, you know, uh, uh, a, one of his barefoot speakers, mm. uh, what do you, uh, it's, um, I can't think of the word, you know, when something just kind of catches on fire, just like it spontaneously uh, combusted. It's, yeah. Basically spontaneously combusted overnight, sitting on the console, starts a fire, falls on the console and the studio burns up. And so he does not have that studio in Burbank anymore. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> Cause there was a lot of stuff in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. He had shared it with Joey Warnaker too, but they didn't, they didn't, it was, the fire was, I mean, fortunately con con uh, contained to the control room. Right. Right. So that like, cause he has an insane collection of instruments that what wasn't lost. Right. You know, good. Some, good. some water damage certainly. Uh, but uh, oh, the, the, uh, I am, I consider myself so lucky to, know uh, all the musicians I, I you know that i've come across like have have so many friendships and so many experiences with so many great so many great musicians it's like they've made me better um yeah it's just insane and yes zach is an, like officially in death cab for cutie for a number of years now right awesome awesome all right um i want to ask you about a record just to get your take on it so august anna because mm -hmm. That was a record, I was in LA when that record was getting made, and it was one of these records that, I mean, I think I actually even may have worked on it twice or something like that, but only for a day to come in and do so. It was one of these records that just seemed to keep going on, and I, I'm, but I never got a good picture about what what was happening with that record, so I'd love to hear about it. Um. Yeah, That you know, I, I mean, Dan and those guys, you know, very, very talented, but I think they were the victim of um, just some of the, the thinking that goes on at major labels and really overworking them for songs. And, um, you know, I mean, sometimes, sometimes an artist maybe doesn't write, you know, uh, a, an album that has uh, you know, the few obvious, even the one obvious songs that, you know, very obvious, uh, in, in, in the eyes of the, the, the labels, um, to sort of feel like that they, that it will propel the album, you know, like be a, a you know, a significant single or like be able to take them to the next level. I, they, they just seem to be sort of stuck in this, uh, place where, um, the songs weren't good enough, you know? And it was, it was sort of like, okay, well, we'll give you a little rope so you can go kind of like start to record and, and kind of, I think in hopes that like, okay, well maybe this will kind of kickstart things. And, and um, I, I, where I can't, where I came in um, it, it, that, that seemed like it had been going on for a little while. And there was a bit of a desperate feeling, a bit, a little bit of a confused feeling um, within the band. And it f almost felt like, a, a little bit of a last ditch effort. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, I mean, I really enjoyed working with those guys and Dan's songwriting and singing is, you know, world-class. Um, but, uh, it just was kind of an, you know, just sort of an unfortunate situation where they sort of had this dark cloud hanging over their head. Um, and I felt like I was, I mean, I not felt like I was being sort of put in a difficult position between the band and the label to kind of uh, sort of make these things happen, get, get better songs, get better records to happen than, you know, but I was like, so it, it, 
you know, I was very sympathetic with the band. And so I kind of maybe made a little bit to, uh, of a, an error in judgment where I really tried to protect the band. And I, um, uh, I wouldn't send rough mixes into the label. So I, I, I sort of started to kind of create a little bit of a frustrated situation between myself and the label. Um, and, uh, you know, that sort of that dogged determination that I have and that like the, the decision-making, I guess that often, I guess, as you pointed out, can work to my benefit. I think I sort of took the wrong approach on that. And I was a little bit too, I, I was using my horns a little bit too much towards the label, trying to protect the band. Cause I was just trying to get them to feel better about themselves right. and so that they, so that I felt like we'd give them a better opportunity for output. You know, I felt like we were getting there, but then it was time when it was time to start to show things to the label. We just weren't really getting the reception, you know, that we wanted. And it just kind of, it just sort of, you know, it took the path that it took. And I don't know if the, the time that you spent with them was before or after me. No know? idea. No idea either. You know, it's just like the, I, I don't even really remember, you know, sometimes it's unfortunate because I really think that we had great songs and I think we made some great records on that album. Um, I get compliments on it occasionally, you know, it's just like that that means something to someone. And it's like, I, I you know, it's like, well, okay, at least there's that. Um, but, um, you know, you go through these experiences and uh, you just, I haven't really spent a lot of time looking back at it. You know, it's just like, I kind of, I sort of walked away sort of feeling like, um, we weren't in the best situation and we didn't get a great outcome. Um, and it certainly was the beginning of the demise. It felt like, it felt like the band was struggling, but that felt like a turning point also for them sort of breaking up. Right. You know, even, even though they carried on and supported the album, it was sort of like, okay, well, there seems like the writing is on the wall. Um, and we were working at the studio on Fairfax called Vox box or something have you ever, you know that place no of it yeah i don't think i ever worked there yeah um it was it was interesting because it was like it was just like this hole in the wall with vines growing on it that's like this gate that you went in and it's like it opened up to this kind of courtyard very shady courtyard and and the studio that i was working in was on the left hand side and then robert carranza had a had a um a setup in that same sort of compound so that i thought that was really that was really cool. It was a Neve desk and it had lots of, had lots of cool gear. It was very vibey and um, very LA. It was, I mean, we were having a, we were having a good time. It just, yeah, it just didn't really feel like we ever got it off the ground. And so I just haven't spent a lot of time looking back at it. You know, I just really tried to support those guys the best I could. And I, you know, I probably made some mistakes, like I said, with sort of trying to positioning myself between uh, them and the label, but yeah, you know, I just, I was just trying to, I was just trying to do the right thing by the artist because I know at the end of the day, um, that's the, like the artist and the records you make with them are the only path to success. It's not all the other, it's not all the other stuff. If you don't get that right, then, I mean, I know that sometimes the machine can kind of make things rise to the top because somebody really has somebody that, that has a, that's a gatekeeper really has a fixed fixated fixation on making that happen and they have the ability to make it happen but at least from my perspective and my input all i can do is support the artist to make a great record and just hope that it's good enough to get to where it deserves to be right um, so that's and you know, that that's was all. A, that was one of those really weird situations where the gatekeepers were the label that had signed the band and had these huge expectations for them because they love them but somehow refused to even acknowledge if the band had ever gotten close to living up to them. It was like a really weird thing. Like, they, I don't know that they could have done anything short of showing up with Sgt. Pepper's. Like, what were they going to do that was going to satisfy the label at that point? It's like the label thought they were something else, I guess, or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's just like, this is where it wasn't ever really, yeah, it wasn't really ever clear to me. And, you know, it gets, I mean, it gets tough. I mean, you know, guys get all, you know, in their later twenties and early thirties and start to have families, you know, and, and, um, they, they start to feel like this window of opportunity is closing down on them and they start to, you know, people, we, you know, we start to make decisions in life sometimes based on just trying to hang on to what we have, 
And most of the time it's not the way to do it, but you know, it's like, sometimes you don't feel like you have a choice. And so, you know, yeah. it's, I mean, listen, I, I think that this, I think this is true of you and me and a lot of, a lot of our friends uh, is that, you know, we make lots of great records, you know, and we have lots of great experiences, but that, but the amount of the percentage of those that make it through to, you know, only by the night status or, you know, whatever oh, is yeah. very small, very small. So you just got to try to do it for the right reason, really, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's always the conversation I have with, with younger bands where they're doing something because they think they should or something like that. And it's like, look, the it's like going in, you know, hey, we're, let's win a Grammy on this one. Like you can't control any of that. So make sure that even if it tanks, you like your record period you got to start there and then you can work your way out in any direction but if you don't start there like what have you got at the end of it well nothing that nothing that would um yeah nothing that in my opinion that you've really focused on in the right way creating it with the right you know uh goals in mind i guess yeah just... i mean you could get lucky and it'll explode because sure. you've you know anyway whatever um <laughs> don't want to get don't want to get too stuck on no that. yeah no i don't I'm, I'm not yeah i'm not i don't want to be cynical but i think it's important to talk about these things because it is you know it should inform people's perspective about what it is they're trying to do yeah you know and yeah not, i mean but you know the 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 landscape's changing i mean the big labels still have the majority of the money to promote things yeah, but they're not. Yeah. But they're not signing things to develop things. No, they they sign if you've already got the numbers. If your TikTok analytics are good, you'll get a deal. Otherwise, you know, good luck. Yeah, I mean that's the way it, that's the way it feels at the moment to me. Well, it's been like that for a long time. I mean, there have been A um, and R target numbers for social media since MySpace. You know. Yes, it's just become so pervasive because. Um, but you know, um, basically though, it, we all, it's democratized. We all have, you have a label, right? I have an imprint. I have an artist management company. It's just like, you know, just with a little bit of a little bit of hard work. I mean, you and I can put music out on Spotify and, you know, put a, put a, you know, imprint on it. And, you know, it's just like put, put video, you know, social media content and promote it and it, all that kind of engagement too. It's just like, why would you why would you want to do all that work and then you know partner with a big label i mean it's like i still try because they have the you know they have that money to like blow things up but you yeah. can still do the opportunities there is i guess what i'm trying to say so yeah absolutely absolutely and the tools that the major labels use are the same ones you'll use if you hire a pr company promo social media whatever all those companies are the same ones. They don't even have departments at the labels anymore in a lot of cases. No. Nope. So you, you you can do it yourself. I mean, and it takes money. And it, as you say, it takes a hell of a lot of work. And a lot of it feels as though you're hitting your head against a wall that will not break. But it can. It absolutely can. All right. Yeah. So look, we got we got other records to talk about here. Okay. I can okay, skip so. I can skip over a couple um I don't even know what I want to skip over here cuz like Well don't skip over. I'll just make the answer shorter. How about that? Well, no. All right. Well, let's hear a little bit about the Cold War Kids record. Okay. Well, um that was, you know, here again, you know, the success and the spotlight that's shown on me from Only by the Night, Kings of Leon. It's like those guys wanted to they wanted to sort of branch out, make something you know, a little bit, they're very, they were, they started out as a very experimental kind of indie band and they kind of wanted to keep, keep that. Um, but also sort of like swing for the fences a little bit, you know? And so like I had been identified as, you know, maybe someone that you could consider that could help get that job done. Um, so sort of, you know, engage them and, um, uh, well, I, I mean, the process of some of that process of that album was really cool. We decided that we would finish writing the record in the studio. So I, so they came to Nashville. We booked this small studio called house of David um, for a month. And we, um, we worked at house of David, basically demoing and finishing the writing 
Um, but with the idea, it's like, we're going to do this in a legit studio because we might keep some of this stuff. Can, can and, I just and, say that is a really weird name for a studio? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm trying to think of what David's last name. So David, oh, I'll think of it. Uh, well, he's the, he was the piano player for Elvis. Right. Okay. So, so um, it's the house of David. I love it. I mean, house, I absolutely love it. But when you said house of, I was expecting pretty much any word in the English language except David. <laughs> David so anyway, yeah. so, so go on, go on. So, so we worked. And so this is like in the, the same, the alley behind house of David is, is just like basically the alley that ocean way Nashville is like, they're just like almost, they almost back to back. Um, and so we spent a bunch of, we spent a month at House of David and then we're like, okay, we're going to go over to Ocean Way and re-record some of these demos, right? Um, and and we did, uh, we did, and that was mostly successful. There was a few songs that we just, that we just couldn't get happy with the band, especially Nathan, the singer. Um, and we ended up booking sessions out in, uh, LA at Sunset Sound to kind of redo a couple things. I'm, tr um, I think Upside Down. I think is that the song. I mean, we recorded that like three or four times, and it wasn't until, um, like the third or fourth time that we were recording it. Maybe the second time at Sunset Sound, it's like it felt like we unlocked it. Now it's like that was a pretty. I've never, I've never in before, not struggled is the right word, but like found something to be so elusive. Um, but we had like this, you know, big moment, uh, recording that it was like, suddenly we unlocked it and everything kind of fell into place. Um, there is a song on there, um, on the album called out of the wilderness. And, um, we were, we were re-recording it at ocean way. We had this really cool version, uh, that we'd done in house of David, we were trying to re-record it at Ocean Way. I was just like, it just wasn't feeling right. And so we were go we were going back to the the well, we we were going back to the session that we'd done at House of David. And I was just like, man, that rhythm section part is so cool. Uh, it's like, well, why don't I put the bass and drums over in the left speaker and the new stuff that we're doing in the right speaker, and we'll just keep the rhythm section and you know we'll put new guitars on it. Um, and it's, it was just really, it sounded really, really cool. So we did that. So it's got two band performances in it. Um, we might've kept jo uh, Johnny's guitar, the his rhythm part um, from the, from the house of David, but the bridge, Nathan still wasn't happy with the bridge of the song. He kind of wanted to rewrite it a little bit. So, so it wasn't going to work with either of the, you know, either of the versions that we'd kind of put together. So we just, when we were, did we do it? I think we did it at Sunset Sound. We recorded a new bridge and just cut it into the song. So it's cool. It's just like the, the song is like these two rhythm sections that gets to the bridge and it's just bam to, and it's like one performance. Um, and then it goes back to finish the song. It was just, that was just a really cool, kind of a really cool thing. I, you know, just, just it, all it, that's my style is just get in, get in there, be prepared and find it, you know, take the journey and do whatever it takes to get to it that place of where it feels done accomplished. So the song that you had to unlock, as you call it, do you remember like what wasn't right about the earlier versions and what changed in, or was it just chipping away and chipping away and all of a sudden it's there? Chipping away. I think it really came, what it really came down to is just finding the right drum performance. And not that Matt was not, Matt Avera was not, giving a great performance. It was just his interpretation of the way to play the song was not meshing with um, the other band members. Right. And then, and then that not meshing was not satisfying me. And, you know, and they're looking at me to kind of like direct and solve and sort of, you know, move things ahead. And I just, it just took me a long time to be able to, to figure it out. And I just remember that the, you know, one evening at Sunset Sound was like, it just sort of like came to me like a, like a bolt of lightning. And I was like, uh, you know, I just kind of talked Matt through my idea and, 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 it, and he got it and he got onto it and it kind of made it his own thing. And it suddenly got this life 
and he played it and we like were listening the rest of us were listening to him play to the tracks in the control room and we're like high-fiving each other it was like that's it it's like where the fuck has it been all this time yeah. but i don't really remember why what it just it just never felt like it you know got off the ground it just never felt like it come came together in a way that felt compelling or that we as a group um felt you know moved by so it's like i mean that's part of it you're just in agreement you know some some record makers are like this is the way it is this is the way we're going to do your song there it is now go in there and do your part and and i'll handle the rest I, you know it's like i don't do things that way um it just doesn't it doesn't really make any sense to me because it's not then you're not it's like why did the label think augustana was so great but then not not like anything they did yeah right yeah so it's like i you know it's like okay well so i I just don't operate that way so it's just like it's a journey and i think that's what's fun i mean it was i mean it was euphoric when we um when we landed on that you know and did you have any fear that you were going to hear it the next day and like oh hold on that wasn't it or you just not not at that point not at that point no because we had because we had like worn ourselves out over it right you know for that it's like no i because the it wasn't it wasn't like it didn't feel like the elation was out of relief it felt like we were like we'd actually it. discovered it you know it's just like right the fuck, there it is you know and yeah. it felt you know, it felt genuine among the whole group so it was it was very satisfying that's awesome yeah bob rock was talking about it last week i was like figuring out where the song lives and a lot of times it's obvious but sometimes it's not no, uh, uh-uh, no. I mean, that's a. I mean, that the Bob describing it that way. Um, yeah, it's it's very apt. It's just like, yeah, it's like what what feels like the home, what feels like the the sphere that it it lives in. Yeah, awesome. All right, that was it. Was good. It was succinct. All right, I'll, <laughs> it doesn't have to be though. This it doesn't have to be at all. All right, while we're talking about bands um, of monsters and men. Because it's mm. another little bit of a left turn, ish. Yeah. But also, yeah. I wanted to ask about this because uh, Craig Sylvie mixed it. Mm-hmm. Was that the first time? Because it seems as though, unless I'm missing something, that was kind of the first time you were not mixing your own production. Is that right? Um, ish, even ish, ish. I think so. So Craig, Craig has mixed two albums for me he mixed editors and um uh, yeah and of of monsters and men now the reason yeah i think that might i think you're right andrew i think that i think that is correct so the reason that i made that decision um was that so of monsters and men and this is similar to what what happened with kaleo uh another icelandic band is that they had made an album on their own, in their own country, of with their own dollars, um, and had put it out. And you know, some savvy young person uh, heard it and started playing it on a radio station, I believe, in Seattle. And so, so you know, they had released it in Iceland. They hadn't released it internationally, but you know, somebody had kind of gotten a hold of it and started playing it, and you know. Some t- somehow these things, when they're real special, kind of like they they you know circulate the globe real fast. And um, uh, Republic Records sort of sort of got on the trail of them uh, and signed them to a, a, a record you know record contract. And they were going to they were going to release the album internationally. And but uh, so but then the then the thought at the and they had already so the the biggest song on that album is Little Talks. Little Talks had already been you know had already been recorded and produced, uh, and you know they want they every I mean Little Talks is the one the the song that had started playing on the radio in Seattle and or is it Philadelphia? Anyways, it's beside the point. Same thing, um, really. Yeah, but, same thing. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> just made a lot of people angry. So, so, uh, oh, well. Um, um, so they knew that they had, I mean, so they knew that they had kind of a hit song, but they didn't feel like they had any other songs on the album of that sort of immediacy. 
Um, uh, and so what, so I got a call because, you know, I'm a band person and, um, you know, I work, I've worked well with international artists. And so what they, so what was proposed was like, would you be interested in this? This is what we'd like you to rework some of the songs on the album because we feel like the arrangements could be better. Some of the, some of the, you know, some of the music could be reworked, you know, let's kind of try to make some singles out of these things. And uh, we'd also like you to record some new music in, in hopes to have something that feels uh, like it could follow up little talks. Um, and I said, well, yeah, sure. You know, I mean, I love this music and, and this band seems really interesting to me. Um, and I so I got the backstory on, on how they'd made it. And they, like the idea is like, well, look, we'll send them, we'll, we'll send them over to you. Uh, you can record it in at Blackbird and, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, well, I'm like, well, wait a minute now. Like, you know, they made this at home with a really good engineer uh, at, a, at a really good studio, well, you know, a, a good studio uh, in um, Reykjavik. Um, it's like, you know, I think maybe it's a bit much, they felt really good about this album when they put it, they finished it and put it out. Um, I think I was like, wouldn't it be a bit much to like suddenly send these young kids that have only really been in Iceland over to America to work with me in this big studio? It's like, want to kind of maybe take them out of their context a little bit. And, and if we're, especially if we're going to rework and add to this album, shouldn't we maybe, shouldn't I maybe go to them and work in the studio where they worked and with the engineer that they used and, and kind of like, if we're going to add to this, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's go to the, you know, let's go to the, the place where it was done. So I went over there and, um, uh, and we, um, uh, I helped them come up with the new song, the, the song Mountain Sound, which was a pretty successful follow up single for for um, Little Talks and like, um, what is it, Lake House? I can't remember all the songs on there, but, you know, we reworked a bunch of songs. And the reason that I chose Craig is because I felt like going into that situation, kind of having the role that I was going to have uh, that putting the mixing job in someone else's hands was probably the right idea because some of the songs that I would have been mixing, I would have had nothing to do with because I wasn't touching every song right. on there, you know? And it's just like, and I was also creating, not only was I reworking songs, but I was creating new songs, which were probably going to have more of my sound and my thumbprint on them. Right. And so I just felt like, you know, let's put it in someone else's hands so that hopefully they'll equalize out all those, dis that sort of variation and disparity a little bit. Right. You know? So that's kind of, that's why I, um, um, and Craig had moved to London along quite a, quite a number of years ago and was, you know, was, was very familiar with sort of international alternative. Cause he, um, gosh, um, uh, names, names, names. He, Craig has had a very successful, career. Um, and, um, I just thought he would, he would have the right sensibility to, to sort of bring it all together. And so that's sort of like how, how that came to be. Right. Right. And it, it worked out. And again, it just shows, you know, you're always thinking big picture, which is commendable because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a lot to let go of really, you know? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, I mean, I, I mean, I, I could, I could ask this of you. I mean, being, you know, being very involved in the recording, being the producer, and when I've hand a record, hand a, a record off to you to mix, I've kind of, it's like I have not, I don't think I've been too overly involved or overbearing or like no. tried to work my agenda. It's just like, I, it's been given to you because you are, you know, you are great at what you do, and you're going to speak into it. And that's what we want. It's not going to be what I would do with it. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's not the normal thing that I, that I do. Um, and it puts me in a little bit of a different mind frame when I'm working on a, a record that I know I'm going to hand off to someone else. I, it's a little bit different than what I would, if I know I'm going to mix something, it's just a, it's just a slightly different thing. Um, I might commit more to a process or a sound right 
you know, um, or I'm, yeah, or I just might, yeah, I don't know. It's just a little bit different. I don't know if there's anything that's very specific about it, but it's just, it's just, just a different consideration. Um, but, uh, I so, mean, yeah. So Go most ahead. of the time when you've had someone else mix, you've known early on in the project that was going to happen. Um, in, that's interesting. Uh, almost always. Interesting. Almost always. And it's because I think it's for, I, because I think it's the right call for the, the end result. Like we're working with Shania Twain. I knew that I was not going to be the only producer. Right. I think, I think, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a bad idea when, when an album is made and you've got a bunch of different, uh, you know, different camps making different songs for the album. Um, someone needs to be responsible to mix the whole thing to bring it together. You know, so it's just like immediately it's just like, well, I'm happy to record and produce, but I think, you know, like, and they were fine with that because Spike Stint's going to mix that, you know, um, uh, like we did when I did Kaleo. Kaleo is a very almost almost identical story to of Monsters and Men because they had already made an album, you know, and you, you know, um, you had already started working with them. And, and I and 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 I had I think. I had suggested you early on before, you know, when I was talking about doing the project and kind of evaluating this in the same way with of Monsters Men, I thought that you would be the, the perfect candidate to bring it all together. Um, uh, now, the one time that I can think of where the project came to me and um, I knew it wasn't really my decision, it was kind of came to me this way is uh, the James Bay album. They, you know, Republic came to me and they said, um, we want you to put together a band for James and produce and record the record, but we want Michael Brower to mix it. That was like, this is, this is what was offered to me and put on the table. And I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, okay. Sounds like a good, <laughs> sounds like a good idea. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I typically have made those decisions because I think it's the right call, you know. Well, uh, with Chris Daughtry, we did that, you know, you and I did that. Um, um, I'm sure there's something else I'm forgetting, but I, it's just as the producer, you know, uh, as the person that's looking at the big picture, um, that's, yeah, that's part of the decision-making process for me. You know? Right. Awesome. Um, so right around the same time of A Monsters and Men, and we'll come back to Kaleo in a second, uh, mm -hmm. but you also made a Melissa Etheridge record. Yes. Yeah. That would be slightly different than of monsters in it. totally totally um that was a little you know uh that was a little bit interesting you know melissa's a fantastic person fantastic talent um really enjoyed really enjoyed that process um you know she was there was multiple producers on that um and she wanted to use her live band which are you know uh great players you know it's just as like but but the, the but the reason that I mention that is because, you know, when you have a relationship with the people that you tour with, you know, and they're not your they are they're your band, but they're not part of the you, you know they're not it's not uh, they didn't start the band all together. Right. It's it's Melissa Etheridge. Yeah, they're hired. They're, they're hired, hired to be the right. band. Yeah. You know, going into the studio, it's just like you're just dealing with. Um, a relationship that, um, you know, a musical relationship that is not entirely uh, built around just making a record, you know? Um, so there was, you know, there's a little bit of me trying to get the hang of what all that dynamic was and that, you know, that relationship. And, um, and um, yeah, it was, you know, I, I, I think, and she was kind of, she was, you know, she was very much in charge of that process. I mean, I didn't, I didn't pick the band. I didn't pick the studio. I didn't pick the songs that I, you know, it was just like, I was kind of, a, these things were sort of assigned. Um, and I think we did it. I think we did a really, really good job. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think it could have been, I think it could have been stronger in the end, you know, but uh, we worked at house of blues out in, um, in Encino. Right. 
um, which is a which is a cool hang, and there's some cool things about that. But the the recording space, I've made a few records there. It can be great, but it's not always great. It's yeah, a it's, little, it's odd. It's odd. It's a little it's a little confining, and you know there's there's some parameters around it that are not necessarily always ideal. Um, but you know, uh, but I've you know I've I've uh, I've made some cool made some cool things had there and had some good experiences. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, good experience. I just don't, don't think from the beginning it was. It's just like sometimes you just get into situations and the potential is a little bit hampered by circumstances, and it's you know no one's really at fault or a bad actor. It just sometimes sometimes it just it just kind of just doesn't quite all come together in the way you'd hope. But right, you know, um, but I but I still show up with the same ambition and dedication to try to uh, affect the, you know, the outcome uh, to be as great as it possibly can. You know, I also realize that, um, you know, the greatest champions at sport or whatever is that they don't win every time, you know, they don't always perform their best, you know? So it's, and, 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 and what, what, what we acknowledged earlier is like made tons of great records, had tons of great experiences. There's just a few that really kind of get talked about, you know, like, for me, Kings, Lawn, Kings of Leon, Only by the Night, it's like kind of like a pinnacle for me, most widely known for it. Um, but that's not the sum total of my experience and my output. Um, it's just, a, it's a small slice. Uh, I'm very proud of it, of course, you know, for many reasons. But uh, so all that to say, it's just, it's just like, we just, we just do the best we can and, um, and let the chips fall where they, where they do. Yeah. yeah that's all you can do. Well, let's speak of another record, which would be slightly different than that one. Is the uh, the Dawes record? Okay, because that uh, talking about musicians, you know, talking about Zach or whatever. You got Blake Mills on that record. No, Blake actually is not part of. Oh, he's we, not part. Of, no, he's not part of that. Um, oh, right. Not part of that because uh, that's. Um, so originally they were called Simon Dawes and yes, Blake was part of the band and then they changed it to Dawes. And, and I think he made a couple records with them, but then Blake moved on. He's incredible talent, Blake. Um, and um, so it was um, just the four, the four, four guys, um, Taylor, the singer, Griffin, his brother on drums. Um mm, <laughs> putting you on the spot by naming no, someone okay. who wasn't in the band. No, huh? I no, put you on a, the spot. It's, okay. it's, it's totally fine. Um, uh, I'm drawing, I'm sorry, I'm drawing uh, a couple blanks. But um, that was, you know, that was really, that was a cool, that was a cool record. I mean, what I loved about the opportunity with, with that is Taylor is such, uh, works on his songwriting craft, so hardcore, um, great voice uh you know really dedicated band to performance and being the real deal uh uh they the wanted to only like you know they really just like only wanted to record on tape very analog just just very like true to the sort of classic art form of recording you know and 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 studio and just they have a very elevated taste in music and they just really dedicated to their craft um, and, uh, so that was, I mean, that was a, a great experience. Uh, we recorded at Echo Mountain in Ash, Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I thought, you know, so I wanted to get them out of LA. I didn't want to bring them to Nashville. Um, I kind of wanted to, you know, knowing that it's that kind of situation where you're mostly trying to get it done as a performance on tape. Um, I kind of also wanted to be away from home. I kind of just wanted to make a special event out of it. So, um, and you know, the Jessica and, and the staff at Echo Mountain are excellent. The, the church studio is amazing. The big, beautiful wooden room with a Neve desk. Um, so we went there and, um, and recorded and, you know, um, the guy, what are the, oh, you, you would know if maybe you can help me remember the, the guys that manage Metallica, um, Oh yeah, Cliff and Peter. Um, Cliff and Q, Peter, Q right. Prime, yeah. Q Prime, yes. Cliff and Peter, thank you. Um, 
that, you know, they're managing Dawes and, you know, they, they, you know, those guys, uh, I mean, those guys are great managers. They know what they're doing. They, uh, you know, they have a lot of confidence from a lot of the successes they've had and they're really pushing, you know, they, they would tell Taylor like, dude, you're afraid to write a chorus. You know, it's just like, you know, they were like really leaning on him and pushing on him and, and wanting me to kind of like help him sort of shorten his song form, sort of have like choruses that had a little bit more of that immediate sort of like singing, sing along quality, you know, not on across everything, but they kind of wanted me to sort of help them elevate the things in that way. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was really cool. I mean, we of course put things, well, not of course, but we recorded on tape and then I would trans, I transferred over to Pro Tools. I mixed off of Pro Tools and we did do some overdubs in Pro Tools, but Taylor didn't even want to sing into the computer. He wanted to sing on the tape machine. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, so it was interesting, you know, it's just like the, the engineers and assistants that were working with me, super talented, you know, wonderful guys, but they just didn't have much experience recording on tape. So like punching things in on like punching vocals in and, um, you know, all these types of things, you know, it's like, I, it was all on me to kind of get it done. Right. Um, so, I mean, love that. I love that experience. It was, uh, it was really good, but, it, but in those situations where you have to get it right to tape, you know, there can be some pushing and shoving that goes on. Um, and so there, you know, it, it uh, I think, I think how I had to kind of lean into things sometimes kind of kept me from making a second record with them. But, you know, I felt like we did, you know, it's just like little things like uh, Taylor and I f like not fought, but we like argued a lot about, there's a song called most people. And I kept saying, I was like, guys, we got to play this song faster. It's gotta be faster. It's gotta be faster. And it's like, no, I'm like, okay. You know, so we, and so we, we record it at the tempo they were on to record it at and the record comes out and I see a performance of them like six months later, it's at the damn tempo I wanted it at, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like, ah, but you know, it's just like, so it's just, that is what it is, you know, it's just, it's just yeah. And were they cool with the idea of recording outside of L.A.? Because maybe I've got this wrong. But, I mean, as far as I knew, they were a super L.A., like, students of the Laurel Canyon scene. Like, that was it. And did they feel like they wanted to record in L.A.? Or were they totally cool with going outside? Um, I think I took a little convincing. But, you know, as I just told them, like, you know, that I wanted to make it a special thing. I just kind of wanted to get in a cocoon and that you know, Echo Mountain is a really special place and it, you know, it would, you know, they, they would enjoy the time there and we could, we could be isolated and they wouldn't be distracted by, you know, being at home, you know, you know, it's just like, there's just, you basically have one purpose when you get up is to go to the studio right? and you're in a cool town. We can have, you know, we can go out and have nice dinners. It's just like, it's a beautiful setting. It's a, you know, it's all these things. It's like, we can breathe a little bit and we're not going to have all the normal distractions of our everyday life. Um, and I, 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 I kind of sold that appeal to them and I, it was a good thing. Everybody was very happy with the, the decision, but it did take a little bit of salesmanship. Right. Nice one. Um, all right. God, there's so, there's so much stuff here, but I'm going to just skip things. But again, if there's anything at all you want to bring up, just bring it up. Cause I'm just like saying, random names of records you've oh, made so please do, man. well so let's talk about the moon taxi record because you i think you had that on your list of um stuff you're really proud of that you've done is that it was on that list right yeah yeah i mean you uh, had it second on your list you had your, okay. your zero on there um uh, but I, I think it's a record not a lot of people necessarily know about so um, the, you know, Moon Taxi is a Nashville band. They went to the, the Belmont College is kind of like the music, like the music college that's here. You know, a lot of people go there for music degrees, music business, especially too. Um, they formed, uh, you know, Tommy, who's the bass player and Trevor, who's a singer have been friends since they were like eight, I think. Um, uh, but they, but, the, but they formed the group, um, at school. Um, I think Wes, the keyboard player, is the last to join. Um, and, you know, they've just kind of been, they've just been working and working and working. And uh, 
And their style has changed a bit over time. You know, they were a little bit more jammy as a band early on. And um, Spencer uh, Thompson, who is a very good friend of mine, I collaborate with him a ton uh, to this day, um, all the time. Um, he was, he, I don't know how many records he'd made. Um, but I think we, I think, um, Daybreaker was their fourth album that I, that I worked with them on. And, and Spencer had, you know, self-produced the band and he's kind of like, um, you know, they all contribute significantly musically, but Spencer's sort of like the, the core in terms of getting things, kind of getting things done and, and leading the charge. Um, and, uh. Yeah, I'm just really, I'm just really proud of it because of um, the relationships I formed, I guess, and that that we we really did some things for them and and with that album that uh, were kind of like jumping off points for me in in the years after, just in terms of my collaborative relationship with Spencer, but that the amount of programming and shaping and sort of um, effort that was put into constructing that record uh, it was it was very constructed and methodical but in a way that just felt it didn't felt labor it didn't feel laborious or overworked um, and I just think that uh, we we really took a band sound and, and and sort of contextualize it in a kind of a contemporary way where we we retained all of the qualities of who they are as a live performing band with a you know, a programmed kind of feel, a sensibility, uh, and kind of just brought it all together. And, um, you know, and I was the first outside producer that they'd worked with too. So, I mean, just, yeah, a lot of, a lot of things like that. And Vance, Vance Powell had mixed uh, some of their early albums. So, um, you know, they, they're like sponges, especially Spencer, you know, and, and um, yeah. So, I mean, it just, yeah, I just really, I just, I, that's, you know, I don't listen to all of the records I've made very much, you know, even, you know, but that is that Daybreaker album for is one of the ones that I will go back and listen to, especially in the, in the summertime. Um, we quite often will put on like a moon taxi playlist and, and, and all the music that is similar, not, it's not just moon taxi that's playing. It's like moon taxi radio, I guess. Yeah. And there's just a lot of, just a lot of cool, cool music that it resonates with. So I, you know, I'm just, I'm proud of it for that reason. And it, and it is uh, out of that experience, you know, I've had a lot of good friendships with all of them. And recently I just made another song with them for universal audio, which um, so this rewinds all the way back to Redwood city, Eric Valentine and Eric's studio uh, hunk of shit yeah hos yeah so um so he eric had a had a warehouse studio in redwood city and um and i started working so i started working with eric on I, we probably talked about all this but on third eye blind mm -hmm. i used to go down to redwood city to work on smash mouth with him on the second album and um so uh michael busby was the studio intern and, and Busby, you know, uh, we lost Michael uh, a couple of years ago to a brain tumor, but, uh, you know, Mike Busby was the, um, the intern at hunk of shit for Eric. And so we, be we became, became long, long time friends. And Busby went on to, you know, write some massive, massive songs with pink and, uh, and produce records with, um, Oh gosh, my brain, but, um, that's sort of beside the point. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, moon taxi started writing a song with Busby and they, they, they had the chorus, but they didn't, the rest of the song didn't really get finished. And, um, this opportunity to do a song, um, to, well, I was going to do a live stream with universal audio. We needed a song to perform live and, uh, we needed a band and a song to do to do the live stream with perform in the studio and i don't remember what what spencer and i were working on but he was here at my studio and we were working on something and the sort of the call came in for that and i was like dude what do you think what about like what do you think about doing this 
uh, this thing with me, you know, live stream, you know, get, get the band back together. And he was into it. And, and um, he mentioned this, this Busby song, you know, and it's like, that would be amazing because, you know, I knew, I knew Busby for more than 20 years. Uh, you guys really like this song you've, and they had subsequently finished writing it. Um, it just would be, you know, I love working with them. It's just like, it would just be a really cool thing to bring it all together. So um, yeah, that's just, uh, just a cool opportunity and, and uh, it makes me feel good that to kind of bring all those things together. You know, it's like, it's, it's funny how all these things get tied together eventually, you know, if you, if you hang out long enough. Yeah. Know. Yeah. It, it, it is amazing. It's a tiny, tiny little world and people keep coming around and yeah. So look, I want to talk about the, uh, the Kaleo record because we mentioned it. We talked a little mm -hmm. bit about it, but, um, it's an interesting thing because like of Monsters and Men, they had made the record. And I don't know of Monsters and Men very much, but obviously they know enough about what they want to make a record. But I know with Kaleo that JJ has one of the strongest visions for what he wants a record to be of anyone I've ever met and is more sensitive to the teeniest little details of what's going on than anyone I've ever met. And I'm curious, how did you balance that making that record and you know anything else you want to say about it as well but that that's it's got to have been i mean obviously you work with a lot of very strong artists who have ideas about things and whatever but i think even in that context jj's probably a little bit of a special case collaborating to make a record and so i'm just curious how that went and how you got him to open up and accept how accepting was he of the outside stuff when you started and how that all happened mm. um well, I mean, it was it was much easier in the beginning that it became over time. Um, uh, yes, he is, you know, he is very driven and uh, with a vision. And, he know, you know, he I mean, my experience is a little bit different, maybe than than your perspective. I mean, he because I guess your experience is only working with him on mixes, right? Well, no, I actually worked with them for, well, yeah, I mean, it was just for a mix, but at the very beginning, I can't remember the first song. Um, way Down We Go. Yeah, down Way we Down go. We Go. And yeah, I mean, in that one, they had showed up and I was going to mix it and they wanted to come and hang out for three days. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, what is, like, I'm going to mix it, and then you'll come in. I might have still been mixing on the console then, or I was half and half, or something like that. And I'm like, well, yeah, but we've got the guitars. Every guitar part, we have straight, we have it reamped, and we've got it through a Leslie, and we need to go through, and, like, you know, we need to experiment on that. And I just said, you guys need to go away and do a rough mix. Like, that's what you need to do. You don't need to start mixing this yet. So I probably could have dived in with them and done that but just felt like that's something they needed to do on their own and make all of their decisions first and then I was just mixing so it, it was a yeah they, I kind of avoided a little bit of what I might have gotten into with them you made the right call <laughs> well I just felt and it, what was interesting is it hadn't even occurred to them like I think like the idea of having all of these options forever and ever and ever was like really exciting to them and it is it yeah it is and i you know and that and um and that that's not wrong right no it's it's not wrong but it's also not the way that you and i are used to being effective at our jobs right so um uh so it yeah it's a, it's kind of finding that balance and, and i would say that that's a kind of a good way to sort of get into um so I was not able to start the album when they wanted me to start it. Uh, you know, I was, I was, um, you know, when they came to me, they were like, we're ready to go. And I'm like, well, let's talk about this a little bit, you know, cause it's like, I, I do have a little bit of a process of where I, I, you know, most of the time, not all the time, you know, when Nora Jones calls you, it's like, yes, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes it's like, well, let me just, let me think about this. Let me make sure that I'm the right person and that you, you know, we talk enough so that you also feel like that I am after, you know, it's like maybe the idea of me is a good idea, but I want you to talk to me and let's kind of work this through because 
not only do I want to be able to make the right decision, I want you to feel like you've made the right decision, that you actually want to be in the studio with me and that we've we've had enough of a dialogue that we feel convicted in our choices. And um, so the conversation, you know, it's like we need a little bit of time to talk about this, but I'm also booked out for several many months. And so I can't start right now. And um, so I think they got impatient with that and they went uh, and started started working and and that's where way down we go got recorded and then i kind of picked up with them after that because i guess that situation didn't fully work out in the end to kind of continue on and i think they ultimately did want to be working with me um so but it was a similar thing where they had already recorded some of the songs they wanted to rework them uh and they do you know the icelandics are they're wonderful people, but they think about things a little bit differently than we do. You know, they have a sort of a different way of processing things and communicating, which is there's nothing bad about it. It's just a little different. It's just, you know, it's just it's just something to get used to. And um, I think that they I think it might be part of the culture because they they spend so much time in winter mm. and there, there isn't, you know, the, the amount of activity is probably not um, quite what we're used to. It's a little bit more isolated, a little bit more hunkered down. I mean, I think that there's thought process as a result and the culture um, music is very much a part of their culture. It's just a little bit different. It's a little bit more of a, an experience of being together. Um, and that's probably why they wanted to sit with you and, and sort of sort it out. And, um, you know, we got into the, we got into the process of, of making the record and, and it seemed like, in hindsight, what I'm saying now, it's like, I think they were just, that's part of their process of thinking. It's not so much that they were second guessing stuff or dissatisfied with stuff. Right. But things just took a while. Yeah. Got to explore everything. Got to explore everything. And I think the last time we spoke, I, I sort of talked about the tempo mapping that we did, mm. you know, um, and, and, uh, and just how long so kind of the discovery process would be. And, you know, with JJ, um, he's an incredible singer. Yeah. But, but, but he's so, it's just like, he's so picky in a way that I don't comprehend. And um, we kind of, towards the end, I think we started really butting heads over um, getting vocal takes because he would sing, you know, half a dozen awesome takes. And then I'd make a comp and it'd be a great comp. I, you know, and it's like, you know, everybody kind of like, yeah, that sounds awesome. That sounds like JJ kicking butt, you know, he just was not satisfied. He'd want to sing it again. And so we do the whole process over And at first I was kind of like, okay, I mean, it's your art, you, it's your voice. Sure. Let's do it again. I'm not quite understanding why, but absolutely. And we do it again, kind of the same result. And then we do it again, kind of the same result. And sometimes we get to like, we, and I started, I, I, I would, I labeled it super comping because we'd get like three, four, five sessions of singing and comping. And then we'd comp the comps. Right. And it's, and then at a certain point I was you know, like, okay, we are comping. This is the second time we're comping, you know, five take five comps, you know? And it's like, I'm like, what the, what are we searching for? And he says, and he, and, you know, he, one day he said to me, and this is probably where, where the, the relationship kind of took a turn for the worse is like, he just said to me, it's just, it's like, it's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not what I want it to be. And I just like looked at him. I'm like, dude, you're good enough of a singer that if you know what you want it to be, I want you to go out there and friggin' sing it and stop, you know, like, what are we doing? I don't get this. It's like the nuance between the, these comps, it's like, sure, it's a different performance, but you know, it's not like, it's not like, well, this one doesn't sound as good as this one. They all sound great. You know, it's just like, it's very subjective. It's like, I don't think you know what you're looking for. Um, and so that was a bit, that was a bit hard. And we would spend, you know, we would spend hours like getting a tone and a, and a, like a guitar thing for Ruben and JJ would walk in and be like, what are you guys doing? That's terrible. I'll, I'll do it. That's just like, okay, <laughs> you know, um, so it was tough. It was tough, but I mean, but at the, at the end of the day, you also can't argue 
no. with you can't argue with what the power, but it's just not, it's just um, because it's killer. And I'm, you know, I'm sitting here looking at the gold Kaleo gold record I have over here. Um, oh, that's weird. It, they forgot to send me one. That's, uh... Oh, well, you should have one. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have been sent one gold record in my entire career. I have you have to ask for them now. Well, I know, and you got to pay for them. And I like uh, most of the time you do. Yeah. So anyway, but like the one thing I would say about JJ, like I've worked with a lot of people who get picky like that, but then you realize that they don't know what it is that's not happening. Whereas he is ridiculously consistent because, like in mix notes, that you don't go in circles. You don't. You know, no, you're, you're chasing true. something and it might be impossible for him to describe what it is that's not right. But when it's right, it's right. And then you are done with it. It's just sometimes getting there is like you don't know where you're going. But yeah. Like, and for me, for me, you know, uh, for me in the recording producing process, I think it just I, it, you know, I know we did great work and, and, and you know, we have a, we have a lot of songs a lot of amazing songs. I'm very proud of that record. And I, you know, and I liked the process. I don't, I'm not hating on JJ. It's just like, it's just like, that's where I found some frustration. Um, but you know, I would give him kudos is like, yeah, the result is the result is the result. It's great. Yeah. Um, you know, but it was, there's a, you know, there was also some songs like he just wouldn't ever finish writing the lyrics to. It's like, we, we had, you know, we had these, he would say that the vocal's not finished. So he wouldn't, fully sing a finished vocal because he was still working on the lyrics, but we had these incredible tracks and we'd even put like strings and orchestration on them. It's like, uh, it, and it's like, okay, well, we're not going to, I'm like, why are we not going to finish this? Can't you just figure out what it is you want to say with the lyric and let's finish it. And, you know, it's just like, so sometimes there was just some head scratching moments, but, um, but yeah, I mean, incredible, incredible talent. You know, it's just, it's like, but yeah. you know, just sometimes, sometimes the the minds don't. You know, it's just like things just don't don't mesh, and relationships kind of like come to you know come to an end. Did you have you did you mix on the most recent album? I mixed a few songs. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah. They had a bunch of mixers on that one. I think because you know, again, you? he's always chasing stuff. And there was a song actually that I mixed for the first album that didn't make the record. Um, is it Walk on Water? Is that the one? Yes. Yeah. And so then when I'd mixed a couple songs for the new album and they said, okay, hey, we got this other song for you to do. And they sent Walk on Water. I'm like, hold on a second. This sounds really familiar. And I went looking through the hard drives and I found my old mix and I'm looking through the multi-track and like, it hasn't changed that much, but there are enough tweaks. And you're like, okay, obviously I'm not going to do anything anything i'm not going to like pretend and use the old version because there's going to be stuff <laughs> they'll hear it i have no idea what's different but they're going to hear it and so i mix it again and then i think that one ended up um getting mixed by michael brower because like that was just one that no one could figure out what he wanted to do with it exactly yeah. and it's also different artists when you're mixing like he's so he spends so much time on it before you get it that he's one of those artists where you tend to honor the rough like almost to a fault there are just things about it that man like i don't know how i can make that work differently so i guess i'm gonna live with it whereas with other artists you like rip it apart because you can always put it back together but it's not that simple with their stuff and hosier's another one like that but like the progression with Hozier was on the first record, what I got to mix was very, very close to what he wanted. And on the second record, there were some songs where he'd asked me to do something in the mix notes, and I'd assume he meant something subtle. And then it turned out that he had someone else mix it because what he wanted was so drastic that I never would have gone there because I just oh, assumed what was coming to me had been, you know, gotten close. So... I think that that was the thing about working on that second record was I just assumed everything I was getting was going to be that but the bigger 3D version, not invasive surgery, you know. And uh, and did you got did did you not have follow up conversations about the invasive surgery or or did he just no? I mean, it's weird. Like that song, I just never got mixed notes from him on, and I'm like, okay. You know, I, I, but that's what happened the first time too. I think the first time we went back and forth for the first record. 
Um, and then it just didn't make the record because it didn't quite get to what he wanted. So, and I was actually, when I got it back, I was actually surprised when I went back and listened to my first mix, like, Ooh, I changed a lot on that. And it was actually kind of cool, but maybe that's the problem. And, you know, so sometimes you just can't figure it out. And I think for me, that's one of my faults is I'm always trying to figure out what people want. And I won't often just ignore it and do what I want and then see how that goes, which probably I should. Well, I mean, it, but it can be a precarious, I mean, it can be a precarious thing. I mean, uh, I have a recent, you know, experience, I guess in the last year where I sort of, I, I did that thing where I kind of did what I want, you know, and I wasn't like ignoring, I wasn't also, I wasn't also giving, giving a lot of direction and the rough mixes were so bizarre to me that it, I didn't really feel like I could honor them. You know, it's just like, I felt like they were, I felt like they were perspective in terms of like some balance, but just in terms, just in terms of like spatially and tonally and like the way it all stacked up is like, I can't, this is not a reference for me. Um, And yeah, you just, I just never, I got some notes and it felt like we were progressing. I thought we were done. And then it's like, oh, somebody, it's like, oh, I mixed, I mixed all these songs and, and, and and it kind of comes back to me like, well, this is the only, you got, you got this one mix that nobody else can beat. So (laughs) it's going to go on the album. But I'm like, well, okay, that's, this kind of sucks, but okay. (laughs) You know, it's like, but that's, but that's the nature of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you, because you work so much as an, as a mixer, it's just like, uh, you, I'm, sh- I'm, I'm sure you experience that more often than not, you know, cause that's, this is, you know, like that we're just of an age where it's like multiple people are mixing, even though, even though that's not really part of the discussion, multiple people are mixing sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the only thing I ever ask is to just sort of be kept in the loop. Like I'm fine if I don't end up with something or whatever, but I hate to think I'm doing something and then it turns out I'm not. And you know, that's just weird but whatever i mean no one is under any obligation to tell you what's going on no as long as long as you know as long as uh as long as you're paid for the for the job that you've been asked to do i mean you can't really you know like so how much mixing do you do for other people uh these days not a whole lot right not a not a ton not a ton i mean uh well you know i i mean let's see I would say in the in the past year, I've mixed maybe half a dozen albums for outside. That's quite a bit, actually. I mean, I don't know that I've mixed more than half a dozen albums in the last year. So, well, I mean, you know, so it's a couple of them are repeat customers, you know, or you know, so it's like, um, yeah. So, I, uh, the most recent couple I can't talk about because no one knows that they've been made. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, no, no, no. Fair enough. Now, do you do you feel like that is sort of it's a great way to take a break from producing, and producing is a great way to take a break from mixing? Hundred percent, hundred percent. I don't think I I don't, I would not thrive if I only did you know one or the other. Right. I, you know, and um, as as you know as awesome as the relationship I had in in recent years with Colton Lee as my sort of engineering partner, you know, um, it is sort of twofold. I felt like, you know, we had done a lot of great stuff together, but it's for him to really flourish with all his potential um, that he kind of needed to, to, to sort of find opportunity outside of working with me, you know, kind of get out of, get out of that a little bit but then also i was like okay well i've sort of i feel more removed now from the engine like the recording engineer job than i i want to be you know and also so in the last couple few years you know i have steered myself back to what i was doing 10 and 15 20 years ago where i'm record the recording engineer i'm the producer i'm the mixer and right. and doing it all um i'm just doing less of it i'm being more picky about what it is i choose to do um just because i am in a very fortunate situation that i can do that and yeah yeah, but but to answer the question yes for me it's essential that i wear different hats and that i get to take a break and mix it up right absolutely absolutely well look I mean, there are some records I haven't mentioned. There's other stuff, but um, 
should we is there anything in particular like you feel like we've missed i mean no nothing that like nothing that i've really like that i have burning in my brain that i want to say i mean yeah i mean there's tons of stuff we haven't talked about but you know it's like i I, I can and i I can say that just because i feel so grateful and fortunate to have had the career that i have up to this point i mean i would say um that uh you know uh I am just, you know, I'm just looking to always uh, get into other areas of, you know, around music and just dabble in other things and, and, uh, and just, yeah, I mean, uh, I want to, I just want to keep growing and challenging myself. That's like Luna. That's like why I'm so like, uh, I'm so hooked on that and like, and wanting to develop that because I, I like, I like developing, uh, and stretching, you know, developing things and being part of new things uh, and just sort of stretching myself. I don't like being in long-term routines. They turn into ruts for me. Well, and you, you mentioned earlier about the Facebook music initiative. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure. I mean, so I, I'm in a very fortunate position to where um, I have a, you know, there's, there's probably a lot of this that I can't probably sh- I'm not supposed to talk about, but the things that well, I feel- then pretty- don't. <laughs> well, I feel confident that I can say that Facebook has an FMI program. FMI is Facebook Music Initiative. And, you know, Facebook, Instagram, you're, a, you're able to use music with your posts you know, and like commercially released music. Well, now there's a, lic- there's a license that's implicated, a use that's implicated by that. And, you know, so I think Facebook has had the, the foresight and just sort of as a, probably a good business decision to kind of create their own library of music that they own, you know? So it's licensed free. It's um, uh, so, and, and then also, you know, it's like, there's a lot of platforms like, you know, Oculus and there's, you know, there's, there's different, like, there's a lot of things that will eventually probably come into fruition. So they're kind of without knowing where the future is going to land there. I think that they're kind of planning ahead. So they, contract out creatives to um, create music works as works for hire that Facebook owns. So I am a contributor in that. So it's like a, it's a, it's under contract and I get my, get my friends together and we collaborate uh, and we just make music, all kinds of different music. But what is really great about the program is that they license, they will license the music back to the creator. So, um, they could sign, they could work with a, an artist that's like a band or a singer songwriter. And that, in, and that entity creates music for the program that, that Facebook uses, like owns and has, um, you know, the rights to, and it will be, it will get exposure in that system. People will be able to pair it with visuals or whatever else. So it'll get some exposure there, but then Facebook grants back a, um, a streaming license so that, you know, I can put out this music that I'm creating for them and earn and earn the royalties from that. And um, so it's kind of a win win. They're right. they're help. They're helping to curate and create opportunity for artists to create their music. that's in their system and, and license it back to them so they can put it out and put their name on it and, and build a platform for, them, for themselves. So uh, that's something that I'm I'm involved in. And it's been um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been fun for me creatively because there's no agenda other than to create great music that myself and those that I'm working with like. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, we show up and there's no song that needs to be supported. Right. You know, there, there isn't an artist and a lyric and an aesthetic and a, and a profile that sort of defines what it is that we should probably do. You know, it's not, it's not like, it's not like it, it traps us, but you know, there are no rules. There are, there's no context. It's just like, and so it's really liberating and freeing and, and inspiring when we get together because we just, we get together and hang out and get to play and make music. And are you Um, playing guitar? No, I mean, I I do a little bit of programming. I, um, I have played a little bit of guitar and keys on stuff, but not, 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 I'm, I'm sort of like, um, the bringer, t- bringing, t- bringing people together, curating the direction, the ideas, um, 
you know, focusing the inspiration, pairing, pairing musicians together, um, sort of, sort of like, and then also being the recording engineer and the mixer. Um, I'm not really contributing too much as a, uh, you know, as a primary musician. Right. Right. Maybe, maybe, like maybe, we'll, maybe we'll get there. Oh, it's, it's a, it's a blast. It's been um, amazing. It's been amazing. That's been a awesome. lot of fun. And I've started, you know, I've started, a, I've started a, uh, just real quickly, the other current things, I've started an artist management company with a partner. We have three artists, which um, Oliver Hazard, Tishmal, and Robot Monster. Robot Monster, I discovered um, a, a sort of a rock duo that wasn't a band on Instagram, and we kind of formed a project around it. And we have an album recorded, which we'll be really starting to release here really soon. Wow. Um, um, you know, I, I work as a, you know, the executive director of an audio branding company. So there's a company in England, in Manchester that, um, creates custom music for brands. Uh, it's like it's brand sound, the company's PHMG. And, um, you know, I work to have the work I do with universal audio as, you know, some product development. And it is, I mean, I guess it is a little bit of the marketing too, but I'm not, when I do stuff like the live streams and that stuff, I'm not there to, to, to sell something specifically, you know, it's just like, it's a, it's a platform and a product that I'm interested in and I'm really using. Right. And, and I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm helping the development of it and the exposure of it. Um, so in a way, because we do the live streams, it is, it is marketing, but you know, so all these things are other things that I'm doing. Uh, and I also work, I also have a hand in a, uh, a media company that does uh, um, golf, a golf media. So it's like, I, I, I have a lot of things going and um, it's all related to music and creativity and the, and the things that I've always done. But uh, it's like, it's stretching me in new ways and new opportunities. And I, because I don't want to just be in the studio all the time, you know, right. so. And it all, everything informs everything else, too. You get perspectives on, like, well, because if you're doing nothing but being in the studio making the music, you sort of lose the perspective of, like, well, what happens to it once it gets out of here? And mm -hmm. when you can really envision where it can go and how it can be used, it can just be inspiring. I'm totally inspired by it. And it's really, yeah, I'm just uh, very grateful for all these opportunities. And they're all really tied together. So it's like, it's not, it's not a terrible stretch. Some days are a bit hectic um managing yeah. emails and phone calls and and whatever it is i'm you know maybe perhaps mixing or um because when i'm in the studio producing or mixing uh i really shut the rest of it off you know so it's you know so i have to play catch up and bounce back and forth but i enjoy it I, i'm in, i'm more invigorated uh than ever by the diversity right yeah, I think it, it's the sort of being freelance. It forces you to be an entrepreneur. You have to be. So mm -hmm. why not branch out while you're at it? Well, all these things like a management company and, you know, and developing, de developing these different things are, they've always all you know been goals. It's just, I've now gotten to a place in my life where I can make good on some of it, you know? Right. That's awesome. Yeah. As you should. As you should, with all your Grammy foam up on the top shelf. <laughs> I love my Grammy foam. <laughs> uh, you so got some Grammy, you got some Grammy foam yourself. I well, I used to, but I, as we were saying beforehand, I obviously I have kept the statues. There's no question about that. But I've given away the Grammy phone. I think I've got the packing for one of them because people see it and like really love it and like, all right, man. Because it's <laughs> it's like the Bizarro Grammy. It's a shadow Grammy or something. It's a shadow Grammy. Yeah, it's a shadow box Grammy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, should we get Mark in here for a little Q&A? Because I would imagine there are lots of people asking questions. You got you got a little bit of time for that? Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, do you have the time? I do. Because especially once we get to the Q&A, I can switch off. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> I'm, I never switch off. Hi, Mark. He's coming. He's coming. There he is. Oh, but his mic's muted. Oh, we can't hear a word he's saying. Audio people. You know, nope, still can't hear you. Is this one of those where you have to restart your computer? It just says you're muted. About, there you go. All right, cool. All right. There you go. Glad I didn't have to restart. <laughs> Good to see you, Chikir. <laughs> Good to see you too, Mark. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask the first question today because I have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with 
everything that you were just talking about. So you've, you've done all of these records and now you've started to um, kind of branch out and diversify yourself so much. Uh, your schedule is completely insane. Mm -hmm. And this is um, partly just to make a joke. After you get done putting on your pants one leg at a time, <laughs> um, yeah. how do you organize your day like to, to get all this stuff done? Is it, is it kind of like a mixture of everything's coming at you differently every day or you're um, kind of doing like, you know, Mondays and dealing with this, Tuesdays I'm mixing those sorts of things. Are you structuring your, your weeks out? I, stuff? I do, there is a, there is a, a, a significant amount of structure. Um, you know, uh, there are weekly, weekly calls that are, are set up, um, you know, for, for management stuff or with PHMG. Um, you know, I, I'm all, I've always been someone that gets up pretty early, uh, cause I like to, to have a little bit of time in the morning, answer emails, exercise. And, you know, so, so I, I, I have structured in a lot of, uh, of this, um, this stuff. And I just try to just be proactive and stay ahead of it really, you know, just, uh, um, it's what, what is difficult though, is, is to do things, uh, on the spur of the moment, you know, for me, because I'm also very, I'm also very protective of my weekends and family time and just, and my person, personal time, you know? Um, so I, you know, so, so it's, I'm usually three weeks out, you know, it's like, I'm pretty solid for the next three weeks at any given time. Um, unless somebody kind of like, cancel something on it and we got to move it. Um, and then, you know, I, I sometimes get uh, some windows of time. Um, but yeah, it's just a lot of, it's just a being very fluid and placing as much structure as I can into my, into my day, you know? Um, and I have a lot of great, I mean, I don't do it by myself. I had, um, I have a really great assistant Dawson, Dawson March, who is helps me run the studio and has um, taken on a lot of responsibility in terms of the audio stuff that we do um, and helping me with that. And then I have a management partner. Um, I am needing to get, um, uh, I have Dawson in the, in the process of uh, interviewing so he can have an intern, you know, cause he kind of graduated from being an intern to the role that he has now, but as I am in all these other spaces, uh, I'm putting more responsibility on him. And I, you know, so, but I'm having him find an intern uh, for the studio that will sort of answer more to him as opposed to me having an intern. And um, yeah, just have a lot of, have a lot of help. Um, my wife is a tremendous help uh, just kind of taking care of our home life, taking care of me, helping me with, um, you know, invoicing and just all the different, you know, little things. So it's just like, it's a, it's a balancing act. Sometimes like, sometimes I overdo it and get, you know, fatigued and, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I just try, I just try and balance it. I'm, I'm in a real transitional part, uh, part of my life too, where that, where a lot of these endeavors I'm talking about are they're new and they're kind of start starting up, but I am starting to find uh, the equilibrium with it all, you know, and I'm also, uh, I'm also realizing that I need to um, just manage my just different ways of managing my time, and I and I'm I'm only working on the things that I really want to work on now. I'm only I'm trying to only trying to only say yes to the things that I think will really matter in the end for for myself, mm -hmm. and, and that are you know it's like just try to be really discerning. Now I'm sure that I'm going to miss out on some great things, but. I also want to be doing all these other things. So I can't do it all. So it's like, you just gotta, you know, you just gotta say that's, this is it. Yeah. Well, and I think we've, we've proven that you've been pretty good about making the right decisions. So hopefully mm -hmm. this continues. Thank, thank you for saying that, man. I appreciate it. I, I'm just trying to do my best. That's all, all it is. Yeah. That's great. It also seems like you're doing it all. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing a lot i'm doing a lot and i'm like you know yes. it's like i'm you know just like trying to spend as much time you know i have i have like two sons i have grandchildren i'm like i'm addicted to golf i love spending time with my wife um i don't see a lot of you know so outside of um so outside of all those things i just described it doesn't leave a lot of time for <clears throat> social being social you know, all my social time is built into all this stuff. I have a very social life. 
because there are a lot of people in my life, but I, you know, I don't go out a lot. You know, I don't, there's not, I'm not like, I don't do what a lot of people do for like their social life. I don't really have to. Now there's a trade-off with that. It's just like, you know, like Vance Powell is one of my closest friends, you know, it's just, I love that dude. And, and, but we don't see each other very much. It's because he's super busy and I'm super busy. And, you know, it's like literally my studio is like five miles from where he lives. But, you know, it's like, it's probably been six months since I seen him. So it's like, it's just, yeah. that's just unfortunately the trade-off. Um, but it's just really about prior, priorities and balance. And um, I'm really also trying to focus on my health these days too. So mm-hmm. yeah, just, you know. That's a so. wise thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna wedge one more in here. You guys are both extremely obviously successful at what you do, and you've done incredible things with incredible achievements. But you also both built families with kids, and you stayed married. And uh, I'm wondering if either of you guys have tips for people that are trying to manage balancing family life with what we do. Andrew, <laughs> well, look. First of all. I'm with the right person. I mean, that's obviously a huge part of any marriage, but it mm-hmm. with what we do, it's it's even more important that it's someone who understands from the very beginning what you do. Because like now, if I say I got to work all night, which of course now I don't even have to work all night usually, but if I said it, mm-hmm. like, oh, well, of course you do. You're a successful mixer. You have to work all night. But back when you're like doing it for free and you're like, I got to work all night for the next three weeks. I'm not going to see you, even though we have a young son. I had a wife who understood and also knew when it was like, "Mm, you don't need to actually do that gig. And so, and was really smart about it. So that is a huge part of it. Um, I mean, that's all, that's all of it actually is just being with the right person who understands what you do, but then you've got to be, you, you have to make an effort because I know, and I know some people who were married their entire careers, but like missed the birth of children or stuff like that. And I suppose if the person you're with is okay with it, then that's what you can do. But you can't, you've got to prioritize for what makes sense for not only yourself, but the people you're with. Otherwise, you're not going to stay with them. Not. I mean, I have nothing to add other than Andrew nailed it on the head. And, you know, it's like, thank you. You know, my, my wife Monet is the right person and very understanding and supportive. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I was like, I didn't finish mix. I didn't finish a Tom Waits record because my younger son was going to be born. I had to peace out. It's just like, that's just, you know, um, that was a decision I had to make. And yeah, I mean, the, these things come and you just have to prioritize. I mean, everything that Andrew said is just so, so spot on. You have and and you have to work extra hard when you are home to be engaged and spend time with your children or or, you know, whatever. You know, it's just like I got up every day, even if I'd work to two or three in the morning, I got up every day at like six thirty just to sit at the breakfast table for even to see my son for five minutes, just because it's like. You know, it's just like, I'm here, you know, and I'm thinking about you. And that's, you know, sometimes I'd go back to bed, sometimes I wouldn't. And that, you know, but yeah, Andrew nailed it. And I've had a studio at home for 30 years. Mm. So, and to the point where, like, I had to explain to my kids that, well, when I'm in the studio, I'm working, so I can't tie your shoes. You got to find your mom. Like, but they used to just wander in, like tie my shoes. Like, all right, but it it's that five minutes in the morning. It would be just as easy to not see your son for three weeks straight in that situation. But to make that five minute connection, as far as he's concerned, you've seen him every day. It's no big deal. You haven't been doing anything weird. Like you've been around, and that that is a big part of it. Yeah. Great answer. Thanks, guys. Awesome. That's something that I feel like we don't get to talk a lot about. And it's a, it's a challenge for a lot of people in our industry. Yeah. And it's, it's especially hard, as I was saying, when you're not, when you're at the beginning of your career, it's not going well to sort of justify the amount of time it takes. And you've got to be in a supportive relationship, no matter what you do. But I think with what we do, it's especially important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Okay, so moving on, here's our top question of uh, from CrowdQuest, our most upvoted question, and it's from Paul. And Paul says, hi, Jakir. It seems every producer engineer has an aha moment in their career path. What was yours? Ooh, hmm. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I've had a lot of them. I don't know. Uh, uh, or none. I'm not sure what it is, um, which it is. Um, like an aha moment. I mean, as it relates to, I guess, um, I don't know, Mark, what, I, I don't know. Um, aha moment in terms of realizing, uh, what am I realizing? I don't, I don't know how to answer the question. I, yeah, right. I feel so right. stupid, but not being able to, it's like, what, aha moment. I mean, I, I feel like I have aha moments all the time as just like, cause I just yeah. try, I'm just trying to keep my mind always open, you know, it's just like, I'm, to me, uh, the power of being effective in a room full of creative people and being the producer, being the person that's supposed to guide the ship is you need to be paying attention to everything that's going on around you. And you need to be like reading people, reading the room and, you know, trying to just, you know, just trying to focus the energy in certain directions. Sometimes that means like doing absolutely nothing. Sometimes it means like getting in the middle of a, you know, of a fight or, you know, it just depends. Aha moment. I mean, uh, was there anybody that, you know, maybe you engineered on a session and you saw a producer doing something like that, that kind of like clicked a light. You were like, ah, that's what a producer does. Uh, no, I, it's weird. You know, I have, I have my, like my journey has been so, all over the place and so fractured and I've been in so many different environments and it's just kind of like an accumulation of, of it, you know, so it's like, cause I started producing in my first assistant engineer job when they would throw me on the, the late night sessions. It's just like, you just do it because that's what needed to be done to kind of get things to be better than they would be if you didn't step up to the plate, I guess, or, or try to be involved in that way. So, I mean, uh, I just don't, I feel, I just don't know how to, cause I, cause I, I wake up every day looking for the opportunity to have another aha moment, you know, it's just like, or just, cause it's a lot of little things. I don't, it's not, I've never had like one big explosion of like thought in my life. It's just, it's just like this small little progression of step by step by step. And, you know, um, I do really have a long, a very long term view on things i all you know i'm uh, i look so far into the future uh, you know and i dream so far out um to, to inspire myself to have the energy to, to, to sort of keep going towards something it's just so far but i also know that the only way to really get there is through hard work and step by step by step you don't you just don't leap out there you know, it's like, I mean, sometimes you might, you know, sometimes you might catch a ride on something that gets you really far, but that's not really dependable. You know, it's just like, I know that I can depend on just taking another step. Um, so I don't, I mean, I guess I don't know how to think about that the right way. I don't know. Or I, no. you know just, well, that was I'll, the way. I'll answer yeah. it. I'll answer it sort of inside out. Cause I think there's like an aha um, concept that as you progress, you eventually get, but it doesn't happen in a moment. And it's the thing you sort of know intellectually, but you don't believe it. And then finally you start living it, which is to get rid of all of the motivations for doing stuff in a session other than what you're hearing. To only be thinking about the music and not be thinking about the fact that you think it looks cool if you do this, or someone will like it if you do this, or and to just get to the music. And for me, it's that phrase, you know, the only thing that matters is what comes out of the speakers. And I've turned it into a talk or whatever. But it's a really, really important concept. But it takes a long time to actually start living it in every situation when you're working on, on music. So it, it's an aha thing when you can get to it. But it's, it never happens quick. So, yes. So... I appreciate you saying that because that's where I was stuck as this I'm, uh, but that Andrew's exactly right. Exactly right. So look, I'm going to ask the next one here because I, I wrote this down. Well, I typed it. I have absolutely no idea why at the end of the list of notes here, I just have the name Kevin army. 
why do I have that hmm. on this sheet? Is that from like I was I got a phone call or is this something to do with you? Uh, Kevin Army was an engineer producer in the Bay Area, San Francisco, that worked on the second or third Green Day. He was like kind of like he was very influential in sort of like the, the sort of the punk punk rock scene that that kind of Green Day came out of. Um, and Kevin recorded a lot of those bands. I didn't know I didn't know Kevin uh, very well. I uh, I I for, oh man forgetting the record that he brought into toast that I worked with him on. Um, but um, I'm drawing a note. Who's the, does, do you guys, can either of you guys know the producer that did the first Maroon 5 album? He also did Faith No More. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, got the same management as him. Um, yeah, absolutely. I will find that or Mark, Mark will find it because I'm spacing on his name. I'm looking. Super, super nice guy. Is it Noah yeah. Passive? No. No, that would Who? not be him. Uh, no, it's um. Oh, I, I've, I'll if find any, it. If anybody, if I've forgotten somebody's name temporarily that is listening, I apologize. You're probably not, but I apologize. Um, uh, Matt. Yes, yes, you're getting there. Um, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> this I'm seriously searching. This yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and chat I, room, help us. Huh. Matt Wallace. Same, the chat room. Matt Wallace. Matt Thank Wallace. You. Matt Fucking Wallace. Um, God, I know that. Sorry, I know Matt. That, Jesus. Yeah, Christ. sorry, Matt. I mean, I know Matt and I have the same uh, attorney, Jeffrey Light. Um, uh, I know Matt's an awesome, awesome dude. Uh, but Kevin worked a lot with Matt. You know, from what I understand, I never worked. I never. I've never been in the studio with Matt. Um, um, so you know, but. Uh, yeah, Kevin had this. Uh, the one thing I remember about two things that I remember very specifically about Kevin Army is that he loved recording guitars through the um, uh, Altec 1567 tube mixers, the mono tube mixers. Um, he would, you know, he he would stack up a couple of those barrel connectors, those those uh, the the um, the attenuators. Yeah, because yeah. The, the signal coming in from the from the fifty seven on the Marshall cabinet was just like so hot for this for this mixer. But it would he would pummel the mixer with that signal, and that was like his record path for the guitar. And he was just getting so much saturation through that. I thought that was kind of a cool thing. I was like, ooh, that's a really, I like that. And then um, he also positioned his overheads. I think he was just re- used to recording drums in in low low ceiling studios instead of putting them over the drums like this he pointed them like they were cymbal high pointed at the cymbals like like um the parallel to the floor yeah i know i've Um, seen that i've seen that from a few people what's weird is like it's really cool until they hit the cymbal because then it waves yes that's why i don't like it (laughs) but yeah yeah, but so those are the two things and he had them really wide um and they were pretty they weren't they weren't super close they were kind of like maybe five or six feet back. But, you know, those are the two things that really stand out from uh, from Kevin. Well, there you go. All there you right. go. I'm glad I, I <laughs> brought him up. <laughs> Very odd. Awesome. Okay. All right. Next most upvoted question from Matt LaPlante. When you're learning to mix, in your opinion, is it better to mix a lot of songs fast with less attention to detail or less songs with more attention to detail until you're happy? Um, well, if... I would say probably mix a bunch of stuff fast because that's, I mean, for me and I, I, Andrew, I'd be interested to see what your, what your process is, but these days, and this has kind of been going, it's kind of been growing and exponentially kind of building for me is I like to uh, mix as fast as I can now, you know, fast is relative compared to the work that needs to be done, you know, um, but just kind of get in there and react and kind of put it together um, and then step and then take, take a step away from it. Or just, you know, sometimes what I'll do is I'll mix a whole album pretty fast and then go back and make mix notes and then do, do like a revision where I, I slow down a little bit and I get a little bit more particular about things. Um, I think overall for me, the process goes much faster. I get bogged down a lot less. Um, and I, I'm, 
I'm not second guessing myself as much because I know that I'm a purpose built in a review process, um, but I'm also reacting uh, creatively and essentially to what it is to kind of get it going. So um, of the t- as you're learning, I would choose the work fast and then take the result and figure out how to 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 tinker with it and get it figure out what the few things that are essential to dig deeper on to then get it to a, a more fully realized place. Andrew? No, I, I agree. I like that idea of, of going really fast and then giving yourself mix notes and coming back. Another interesting approach just while you're learning is, I don't know if they still do it this way, but Abbey Road Institute, when they first started, were teaching like the evolution of mixing. So you would start where all you could do was balance and it had to be in mono. Then you were allowed to have one EQ on the mix bus, but you're still just balancing and you're in mono. Then you could be in stereo, but still no individual processing on the tracks. And it just would force you to learn about balance and not like, oh, I got to tweak the EQ and scoop that thing out. Like you can make it work with no EQ, no compression, no nothing, just balance. And then, so working within limitations to learn stuff, because the the key is to learn how to make it sound like you want it to while keeping perspective. And so by moving fast, you keep your perspective. And by limiting the tool set, you're not going to get bogged down when you don't really understand how to deal with release times on a limiter. Like, who gives a shit about that? How about no limiters? And now get to work and just see what happens. So, yeah, limit your tool set. That's great. Awesome. Um I just I thought of a question that's never come up on any of these that we've done or any other Q and A's. Does it have to do with sandwiches or? (laughs) It does. Yeah. No. (laughs) Um, Well, sort of. Let's say a record is a sandwich. Uh, When you get a whole record to mix, do you send out each individual song as you finish the mix, or do you send out the record all at once for mix notes? Um, I used to send well. I think it's a little bit uh, now, I think for me, I think I would um, look to do it situationally. Um, but I used to send them out one at a time and I sort of just, you can get bogged down in that and you, and, and you, you kind of, you're, you're not really, it does, it does a couple things. You're making the artist wait a long time for each song to kind of come in and they're also everybody's nervous at the beginning of a mixed project, right? So it's like that you're you're kind of like a little bit like oh they're gonna like it, and they're you know they're they're waiting for that mix, anxious to hear something, and they maybe put too much if, if it's not you know if it's not exactly right, maybe they put too much emphasis on it not being right or getting too nitpicky. I kind of like the idea of if, at least sending them kind of in in groups now uh, of songs. Maybe like if you're mixing a whole album, maybe mix half of it and send it. But I've kind of now gotten into the habit of where I do the, I do the fast mix process, a little bit of review process, and then I'll send it all. And, and what, what that helps do is I feel like on the other end is, it's like, it's kind of a lot to listen to, but it's the whole thing. It's like all the different places it's going to go. And I also know that I in particular learn the sound of the album over the course of the first few songs I'm mixing. Um, uh, Sometimes the first one can be the hardest because it does kind of, for me, because I kind of, I do have a bit of a template, but I also kind of, I also am really respectful of what the sound of the record is and how to best, you know, make it 3D and uplift it. So the first song is really critical in sort of setting the tone for the rest of the album. Um, And, uh, so sometimes you can you can kind of get the first mix close to where you want it to be, but it's not until you've mixed other ones, then you can kind of go back and visit it with perspective. Um, I, yeah, I used to send them out more a song at a time. I, I've sort of found where that wasn't as valuable. And it was sort of, that was dictated in days past because of the technology we were using, we weren't able to jump around as much. Yeah. So you, you kind of like, you were forced to do that. Now I think now that we have the, the the ability to to do like the process that Andrew and I are talking about, it's better to send songs out in multiples at least, um, 
and uh, kind of take a little bit of the focus off just it being one song and especially especially that first mix, you know. Um, uh, that's the way that I would, that's the way that I would handle it. Um, and even, you know, even with that, an album that I mixed recently, I, um, uh, I, I asked them to not come till I had a few days, a couple few days in just so that I could mix on more than one thing. And then I could kind of hit them with, you know, when they showed up, I could kind of like, okay, well, here's where I'm at on these, a few of these. And then it, the conversation just feels a little bit easier too, because there's more context and just a little bit more development. Would, yeah. Would you, would I, you I agree. I mean, I will almost always send the entire record at once, partially because mm -hmm. I like to mix the entire record at once. Cause you get into such a headspace that you'll realize something about the room mics and like, Oh shit, that's what was going on in these other four songs. And you can go back and you change it. And, but you're not even going to remember that two days later. So you want to kind of take yeah. care of it all at once. If there's any sense of doubt about whether I'm the right person to mix the record or if they've got other people going and I feel like I need to kind of make sure we're going in the right direction, then I will work on the whole record, but I'll finish three songs. I hate sending batches of less than three because if you send three, you might have totally missed it on one, but if you totally miss it on more than one of three, then you're not the right guy and you shouldn't mix the record. But generally, at mm. least two out of the three are gonna be fine, and it's just some mix notes. And otherwise, you put way too much pressure on that first mix, man. Holy shit, is that a lot of pressure. I hate it when they've got one song done early because it's gonna be the single, and then you're gonna get the rest of the record. It just, yeah. It, yeah. But I mean, you know, so you do what you have to do, but 90% of the time, I send the whole record. Yeah, I, I think used I just to, had I, an aha moment. Oh yeah, good. <laughs> so, yeah, I used to. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, fifteen years ago, I used to like be not. I would lose sleep. I couldn't sleep. I was so worked up over like getting not only the pressure to get that first mix out, you know, soon, you know, um, just but then also just just being able to let it go and send it and and just sort of like wait for the answer you know it's like am i fired already um so. yeah <laughs> yeah i don't miss that that's no yeah everyone i do i send out song by song and i don't think i'm ever going to do that again <laughs> <laughs> uh so chat room on crowdcast i just started a poll and you guys can uh vote whether you send out one at a time or a full album as well and help me on my journey here of aha moments. <laughs> okay, uh, so on to the next question. Um, this is from Bunky Hunt, and he asks, can you talk about the amps and mic setup slash signal path for the guitars on Aha Shake Heartbreak? Those tones are so damn good from Bunky oh, Hunt. Thank you, man. Um, yeah, uh, they were using combo amps, so, you know, small, small, you know, probably 15, 30 waters, nothing, nothing too beefy, small combo amps. I don't remember what they were kind of like, you know, like maybe a Fender Tweed. I don't know if Caleb had started playing through his matchless yet, maybe. Um, but uh, like I said, they were set up in a circle, a semicircle. Uh, so you get drum, just sort of drums in the middle. Uh, and then the guitar, what the guitars? No, so it's like, as I'm facing them, the drums, drums in the middle. Um, Matt was on my left, and then the, the the Caleb's guitar. So the guitar amps flanked the drums, and then Jared on the bass was off on the the farthest to the right. And the reason it was like that is because. Caleb was standing in front of the band, in front of the drums, and I wanted his amp sort of like hitting him in the face, not. Oh, not from the side. So Jared was over there. Um, and like I said earlier, uh, it was just um, uh, seven microphones. So the seven microphones, um, I'll just give them all to you just so you, for the context. I know you're asking about the guitars, but I had four 87s. I had one... Uh, one D12, D112, uh, an SM7, 
and I had KM84s on the piano and for percussion. And then uh, on the bass amp, I had a U47. So I used two of the 87s as overheads um, and the uh, kick drum, uh, the D112 on the kick. Uh, I used an 87 on each guitar amp and um, I used the U47 on the bass, SM7 on the vocal. And um, so, uh, you know, the amps are just sitting on the floor and, and, and because, you know, because of the deadness of the space, um, and kind of, it wasn't, you know, it was open sounding, but not very lively because it was kind of a sound stage. Uh, I started like I started with the bass. I started with the bass. Um, I know you asked me about guitars. I keep talking about everything else. I started with a U47 too far off the bass cabinet because um, I was, you know, because I was curious about like the Paul McCartney thing with the with the coals that Jeff Emmerich did, where it was way back off the amp and letting the the low end develop. And but that was that was no good because there was just too much leakage from everything else. So I got the the bass uh, the U47 a lot closer to the cabinet. It was a it was an acoustic, um, one of those old acoustic bass uh, cabinets. Um, and then the guitars, the 87s, I had them upside down so that the uh, the body, the, so the capsule was below the body. Um, and I didn't put them right up against the amps. They were, I would say they were not quite a foot off the amp and they weren't, they weren't, they weren't like if this was, if this is the speaker cone, right? I didn't have the the diaphragm looking straight at it. I had the I had the diaphragm kind of up up here, kind of looking down. Um, and I did that. The reason I did that is because I wanted to I wanted to you know it's close enough that I got a direct, pretty isolated sound. But I wanted to get a little bit of the sound coming up off the floor too. I wanted to they were back you know the mics were backed off about this far. I wanted to get a, just a little bit of the sound to develop because I only had one mic. I didn't have, I wasn't blending mics. And I also, um, in that space, I needed to let the sound develop a little bit. Um, th there was no, we were recording to tape. So um, the saturation and kind of gluing together compression uh, was sort of just running running the, the signal to the tape at just the right level. Um, and we were using that TG console. So there's a bit of very simple EQ, no compression, one microphone, uh, you know, mic that way straight to tape. And, and, you know, the way that I had the guitar amps set up with those 87s was very, very similar on both of them. So there's the long answer. Nice. Wow, cool. That's great. Okay, next question. Uh, how, are, how are we doing on time? Everybody good? I'm, I'm fine as long as y'all want me. Okay, uh, next one is from Jimmy from Seattle. And he asks, what band or artist would be a dream come true for you to work with that more than likely you'll never get a chance to and why? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Uh, I, I need to answer this text. You should answer that text. Yeah. Do you have an uh, answer for that one, Andrew? I'm not prepared to answer that question. Because <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, I mean, for years I was chasing Motorcycle, and now I've gotten to make like five records with them. So that was a good one. Um, but back to you, Jakir. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so dream band. I have, I, I have my dream band. Um, but he's got a tag on the end of it that you'll likely never get a chance to work with. Oh. And I'm gonna like pre-exclude death here. Yeah. I. Um... You know, I, I it's kind of a it's kind of, what what Andrew? No, no, just and the corollary is with people you have worked with. Is there anyone you've chased to work with, and then mm. gotten the the opportunity? No, I you know the I learned very early on and with with I learned very early on with situations that maybe aren't you know as well known um, that I'm just not a good I'm just not a good chaser because it puts uh, it, uh, it, it has 
Cause I didn't really truly understand. I'd like, cause when you're chasing something, you don't really know. It's like, if you're chasing something, you're not close enough to it or familiar enough with what it actually is to know if you are the right partner for it. And I learned early on that um, just sort of by, I guess, circumstance that I was more successful with the things that gravitated towards me or the opportunities I were in that I was in that sort of where I was able to flourish and grow. Um, anytime that I was in a situation where I tried to uh, get myself closer than I, than it, than I, than I was where like, you know, it's like not necessarily a wall was up, but it just wasn't like, I wasn't fully invited in to the party. You know, I was there, but I wasn't like part of the cool kids, you know, um, anytime I tried to be cool and be part of the, that crowd, um, it just, you know, I wasn't myself. And because I wasn't myself, it just never turned out well. And I just sort of learned early on that, um, the things that um, that kind of came to me naturally uh, were always the best things for me. Um, you know, so I, I've been better at saying, like I've been better at saying no to a few things than I have been trying to get a yes right. from something. Well, then I think the really good answer is to look at your inspiration playlist because that's the stuff you love. Mm -hmm. So if they want to know what you love that you haven't necessarily worked on, there you go. Yeah. I, you know, I used to think I wanted to work with you too, but that time has passed. I think you're the only person on the planet who hasn't worked with them at this point. Well, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> we had a we had a run on people who'd worked <laughs> with you too for a bit. It's been quite a few now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no. I mean, it's like I would have never imagined. Like even with all the lofty goals that I set for myself uh, way way back in the day, I would have never imagined that I I would have had it as good as I've had it. So it's it's like. Um, I can't really get past, past like thinking I, you know, I missed out on something. No, you know, no. Well, all right. So let me ask yet another slightly related question. Is there any recent record that you had nothing to do with that you think is awesome? Just a band we may not have heard of, just anything in particular you're listening to. Mm. And feel free to just say, I have no idea. Cause that's the, always well, the question that makes you blank. Yeah. Um, I'm going to truthfully say I have no clue. All right. No, I don't, don't know. Fair no, enough. No, I, I don't know. It's, you know, my music listening habits are very sporadic. Um, and, mm, you know, I listen to more than anything right now. I've just been listening to a lot of instrumental music. Um, so it's, I guess it's not as artist. I mean, it, that's not fair to say, but it's not, it's not as artist driven in the traditional sense that we as record makers are focused on. Right. Well, who are you listening to? What what sort of instrumental stuff? Oh, it's just like uh, like random like chill beats stuff, like you know, right, just like, right. like pro programmed, like really minimalist. Um, you know, uh, somebody um, what's it? Gets I think is it's like this trap music. I don't. It's just like just random stuff. It's like mostly I listen to old. I listen to like old music now. I don't know. Uh, the we stuff old. I wish, the stuff I wish I'd recorded, you know, but wasn't born yet, right? Um, kind of thing. I don't, you know. I don't well, know. again, it's... that's back to your your inspiration playlist. So I'm sure that's been put in the yeah. chat a couple of times, right? So okay, cool. cool. Next, okay. Next. Next one from Olivier Peters. How does Luna currently fit in your workflow, and how would you compare it to Pro Tools or Tape? Um. Well, it sounds. Well, okay. How does it fit in my workflow? That's all I'm using. Um, it can be a little frustrating at times because it's not a fully realized platform, but it's, um, and it doesn't do everything that Pro Tools does yet. And that's fine um, because it does enough of what I need it to do. And I'm also, I mean, I'm, it fits the choices I'm making creatively, you know, to the way I'm getting things done. So it's like, I, I mean, it's, it's a very capable editor. Um, it still has some room to grow in, in many areas, but um, 
I'm fully in it. Uh, I love recording with it, uh, mixing, especially with it. I've been mixing in it the longest because of the sound of it. And now with the console, uh, implementation, um, and the way that I could put different tape formulas on, on different instrumentation and kind of, uh, the sound of it, I'm using half of the plugins that I used to use. Um, I've just got the hang of it. And, and another thing that I really love is that I can aut like, so to me, what sounds the best about analog that we have not, that we've been chasing with digital for so long and why we use so much compression and saturation and distortion um, is because of the sort of inferior recording medium that is analog, but that we love because we, um, there's something about it because there's a randomness to it. Um, and, uh, it is, it's not as static as digital. It, it has, you know, it, I think those are some of the qualities that make it feel more human in addition to that for the, for the most of recorded history and some of the most important recordings, that's how it was done. So it is, it is, it is, it, 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 it it's imprinted on us that that's the way music sounds like that's that's what feels nice um uh one of the things i love the most is that being able i can i automate the noise on and off on the tape machine emulations um because there just is no sound like this you know um that like that you know just the way that that inter interferes interacts with the re recorded sound and the way that it's reproduced, um, it's very familiar. It just feels right to me, and I I just love I just love using it. And I I'm I'm compressing a lot less these days. I'm parallel compression a lot less, less heavy-handed EQ. Um, I can make I can make choices. I mean, it used to be that we recorded to analog, that we recorded we. You know, as engineers, we recorded the set, we pre prepared the sound to uh, based on the way that it would change with the medium. The, the, it's the way that it was stored and how it would play back. It's like it was not a one for one thing. I mean, now with digital recording, the sound, it's not exact because once it be, once it goes from input to where it's still air particles, and then it becomes static when you actually record it. To me, there is a difference in the sound of digital, just throughput and playback. But it's is no, it's it's far closer, far far closer than what it used to be. In when you were you know listening to something on input and then you printed it to tape, you recorded it and listened to it back. So um, you know. Uh, we used to engineer for the medium, and it's like you know, it's like. You, you had to design the sound to kind of like come back based on how you were recording it or what you were recording it to. Now it's not really the same. So I'm not really sure what my point was with all that, but um, I just, I just like that. Um, I like what it gives me. That gives me character. I'm always looking for character in recordings. I'm uh, always looking for that extra participation from not only just like the microphones and the room and the, the, the gear, but it's just like, I also really love that, that interaction with tape and really Luna is at a place now where that's to me, that's probably one of the best things about it. And it's really simple. It's a very organized analog thought process of workflow. And I, it just, it works for me. I, I can work super fast in it. And, um, and yeah, I just love the result. Um, I, I honestly, I don't think my in the box mixes have ever, ever sounded better. So there you it. have it. Awesome. Uh, we were we were talking a little bit about it before the show too, and you kind of mentioned how like some of the limitation stuff reminds you of the early days of Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. That that was pretty interesting. It is, you know, it's like Pro Tools used to, I mean, we've all gotten, it's, Pro Tools has been around for decades. We've all gotten really used to it. Does a lot of really great whiz bang stuff. There's a lot of implementation that's built into it. It's had the luxury of growing with 
you know, the technology. We we're talking about Atmos mixing and, and you know, Luna's not there yet, but I'm quite certain it will get there. You know, Pro Tools kind of has this, this place in, you know, and it, it, this legacy of sort of being built up. Um, but, you know, it's like 15, 20 years ago, it was a real pain in the ass. And, um, uh, you know, Luna's not like that far back, but it's like, I'm reminded of like when I used to struggle with things in Pro Tools and its limitations and it's where it fell short and, you know, and I did just fine. So, and what I, what I prioritize above all is like the sound and everything I just described is the reason that I'm willing to have less to work with, um, because I don't, because I just don't need it. And I, you know, it's just like, if I need to modify or simplify or be a little bit less ambitious, or if I need to go over to Pro Tools to do a small job, I'm willing to do it. I'd much rather prioritize that sound and my experience getting the sound over anything. Great, awesome. Okay, and you have, we'll do a little shameless plug here. You have another um, live stream coming up with UA, right? To complete the moon taxi? No, we did. We already did that. We did that. You guys did that. Sorry. Yeah. yeah that's our, awesome. Way well, to go, Mark. Everybody can go watch it right now. <laughs> we do, but we, <laughs> we do can have, watch it now. It's better. We do have some cool things. We do have some cool things uh, in the works for in you know the not so distant future. So stay tuned. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, do you set up? Sorry, this question is from Rez. And Rez asks, do you set up your studio sends and buses in advance? If yes, does it set itself up organically or do you have an idea of how you would like the tools laid out and construct it to your vision? So I think he's asking if you use a template. Uh, yeah, I would say that that's a bit of the question. Yes, I, um, I do in general have a, a template. You know, it's like I, I do kind of want to, I mean, because you get, you get into habits, you know, so it's like, and I like to be, when I sit down to a mix, you know, it's like the, um, I do want to have like my vocal effects, uh, you know, a very sort of typical, not generic is the right word, but like what I would typically want to use sort of set up. Now, if a particular reverb <clears throat> is not the right reverb, um, you know, I typically use a couple reverbs on the vocal, a couple delays on the vocal, some micro pitch shift. But, you know, it's just like if the long reverb is not really quite the right palette of sound or color or it doesn't it doesn't really so I'll, I'll switch it out but it but that template and that structure is there and it's important to sort of start that way as as much as you can and have that structure so that you can be more free to sort of move along so when you realize oh this thing wants a little bit of reverb that you just you know you just turn the send up and there it is as opposed to like oh this thing wants a little reverb you know, and then create the path. What reverb do I want to use? You know, it's just like, it's, it's much easier to just send the sound to the reverb. And like, you know, most of the time that, that reverb sounds good. If it doesn't sound good, it's just like, oh, you just immediately know that, okay, I'm gonna switch out that to something else. It's just, I like to be in every facet of what, what we do, like record making, mixing, producing. I like to be as prepared as I can be without it being too, without it being scripted or feeling confined in terms of structure. Uh, but I like to be as prepared as possible so that I can, I can move as quickly as possible. The speed of creativity is like the way I like to say it, you know, that, that, um, you know, I've thought enough about the process and thought about enough of what my vision is for the, for the outcome that I've, I've, I've put enough stuff in place. So at least I'm able to, to, to sort of work effectively and quickly. Yeah, I, mean, I think some, pe some people will, will say, oh, having a template's a crutch and you'll just do the same thing over and over. And I would argue that the you're being so uncreative, clearing the patch base, so to speak, and then patching up similar things over and over and over. It just start with everything and that way you don't even think about it and you'll change what's wrong every single time. I mean, the only thing is complacency is the only thing is going to be your enemy. Yeah, so you know? just don't be complacent. Yeah, listen, listen, <laughs> and listen, and you know, is that great? If it's not great, then change it. It doesn't yeah. mean that, you know. It's like, yeah, but there's nothing to say that something can't be great eighty percent of the time, and if so, start there. Well, how many years 
did we work to get to a place where we understood what our template should be to begin with? Yeah. I mean, in mine changes at least once a month, I'm doing a save as and, you know, but. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 but in general, it is, it may not be all the same plugins or you may not always use the same parallel paths or, you know, the little, yeah you know, tricks, but, and some, some records you might want to use some widening on the mix and others don't need it. But, but wouldn't you say that 80% of the structure of your template is always intact? Oh in yeah, some... definitely, yeah. definitely. So, so why do 80% of the work over and over and over and over again? Exactly. That, that's what makes you uncreative because you're tired from doing all that work. Exactly. And didn't you spend years getting to the point where you knew that 80% of the template was the template? Yeah. yeah. So. But by the same token, don't get a template from somebody else and just trust it. You got you to gotta build your own. And you don't have to build it from scratch. You can take bits and pieces from all over the place, but understand what you're using and how it sounds and how it reacts to things. And yeah. Andrew's template is on that site. Yeah, it's an old version, <laughs> but yeah. It's yeah. a great yep. template. Yeah. It's a great place to, exactly what Andrew said. I mean, Andrew has a great template on Pure Mix. And, and it is, a, I would say, a good portion of it is something that still reflects what he's doing. Maybe not be... It might be different plugins, but it's a great place to start. It's a great place to understand what the like, like a powerful structure is to work to jumping off point. And then you experiment and make it your own. Don't like Andrew's exactly right. Do not trust what someone else, like, you know, it's, it's nice to get compliments about like, Hey, I use your presets all the time or whatever. It's like, well, I hope you adjust them. You know, it's just like, it's a great reference point and it's a great jumping off point and in a way when you're learning to give, give you confidence. I mean, I, when I'm using something that's new and unfamiliar to me, yeah, I call it presets too, just to kind of get a feel of like how it works, you know, but then I don't, it's like, I don't just simply use, yeah. you know, presets. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I used to, to pause and screenshot every video that Chad Blake did. Anytime there was anything on the screen, like, oh, what's he doing? What's he doing? And none of it <laughs> ever works for me, ever. <laughs> well, because that's, yeah, because that's Chad's brain. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely got his own brain. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I have a question for both you guys. And okay. This is great because we have both of you here for it. It's about Kaleo. So, uh this is from daniel robert caron and he says uh for both j and a the guitars sound huge on the kaleo albums but yet they don't eat uh, sorry they don't eat up the entire mix any thoughts on how they were tracked and mixed i'm sorry i had to look at my phone again one more time sorry kaleo man. guitars oh, no problem. Uh, yeah oh guitars yeah, okay kaleo guitars sound huge but don't eat up the mix thoughts on how they were tracked or mixed um, well, I mean, I know they were, I mean, in terms of tracking, um, you know, we multi, multi miked multiple cabinets and amps um, and would, you know, balance and typically deliver, you know, typically take that combination of amps and microphones and, you know, balance, balance it on, on the, on the desk to make a, a sound and try to commit to, you know, putting it in stereo or mono, uh, kind of committing to it and, um, you know, changing guitars, uh, finding the appropriate guitar for the, and sound for the part. Uh, and, uh, you know, pedals were involved too. And just, um, yeah, just trying to be consistent about, uh, you know, that sort of that, that type of execution. Um, it really, you know, guitar, especially because there's, the, the the fine detail of getting a sound right um, because there's so much dynamic and tonal difference in, in up and down the neck and parts. You just like you kind of really have to craft the sound for the part often times, um, uh, and that sometimes takes us a little bit of work. To, especially changing changing guitars a lot is is kind of key. Um, Andrew, what what would you say about mixing it? Yeah, well, but also the the guitar parts are very well thought out. You know, they're not stomping on the vocal and the bass is doing something other than the guitar, which in some bands is what you want to do. And sometimes the bass is doubling the guitars, whatever that is. So there's room for them because musically there's room for them. 
that that really is what defines it i mean and you can see it in the studio all the time even while you're tracking where like the band's working on a song and everything just sounds like shit and like what the hell is going on nothing's working and then you're like well all right this isn't really working let's move on to another song and you figure you'll sort it out as soon as they start playing the other song everything sounds amazing like what mm. the f- it like it sounds like you retuned the kit changed out microphones and it's just because there's something in the way that song is not working that is ruining the sound as well so a really well arranged well played song mixes itself and you could mix it a million different ways and it'd be hard to screw up so specifically on that record i don't i don't remember anything in particular i mean for me the parallel compression that the guitars are sharing with the vocals and the bass is always what really brings the guitars forward for me because they can drive the bus whenever something else isn't happening and then they sort of magically go underneath whatever is more important at the time which is just whatever is louder but they come right back up and it's in a really transparent way that you don't hear them pumping or moving and it's something you really couldn't do with fader rides because it's much, it's a more granular level than that. Um, but I don't remember doing anything specific on that record. So that was an odd answer that wasn't really an answer. But but I'm glad Andrew put a focus on you know arranging of parts, and that is uh, you know absolutely essential. I kind of like just went right to like the sound part of it. But yeah, I mean sound is always secondary to arrangement because a good arrangement just like in andrew's example it's like when the song is sorted out when the parts are sorted out and um it things just kind of mix themselves so um producing and engineering is not just about you know eqs and mic selection and compression it's it's get get you know i'm always i'm always talking about like the source is where you start to get a sound but even bef- but the source of before the sound is the song and a good arrangement and it's like if you don't have that none of it none of it, the rest of it works so if if you know if there's not clarity if there's not clarity in a in a in a relationship that that works um you're not going to be able to mix it into you know success just expanded on great sound starts at the source that's crazy I like that one. We should bookmark that one. <laughs> Future bookmarker. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so I'm going to give you guys two rapid questions here. Okay. First one and is my brain's getting a little leaky. So yeah, we okay. should we should probably yeah. Now I'm looking at the time. We should probably move to yeah a, a couple rapid fire. All right, super fast. Here's here we go. So simple question. How many instruments do you guys play and which ones from JST at JST Studios? Shakir? Andrew? Uh, <clears throat> I play probably six instruments, very mediocre. Yeah, I'm the same. Pro Tools and I have played so many instruments on so many records. Like on the Low Roar records, especially this last one, I played a shitload of trumpet, which I hadn't played in about 10 years took a minute to get the valves moving again uh (laughs) bass and harmonium i play quite a bit i use the modular all the time when i'm producing um keyboards i'm very mediocre at but i can sit in front of a keyboard and find a part and play it and then get it recorded and then even about a minute and a half later i couldn't possibly play it again it's just yeah Mm -hmm. so no i would never subject other people to my musicianship but I play a lot of stuff badly. I'm the same, you know, but I know how to, uh, I know how to finesse it into the, and I know, I know I have a really good idea of what the part should be. And I, and I have enough skill to kind of get some things down and then finesse it into place. Um, I'd much prefer anyone else to play though. But yeah. sometimes, sometimes, okay. sometimes there is a, there's a percussion part or a programming part or a yeah. vocal part that you just gotta do. And someone's blowing up. Yeah. That is me. Okay, uh, this next one's for Andrew. Anyway, Andrew, uh, are you secretly putting out experimental drone records? No. 
<laughs> Not yet. Okay. Not yet. I ha but I okay. have a band name for when that does happen. But yeah, not yet. That's amazing. Okay. Uh, Who's ringing here? What, what's left. going on here? It's, I'm sorry. That must be me. That's all right. <laughs> uh, my granddaughter's trying to Facetime me. I'd I'd love that setting. Oh, nice. You should you should speak to her. Hi, girls. I, I have to call you back. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> love you. But then you, someone, some device hasn't realized that you've answered. Won't we'll let go. Oh, yeah. shit. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Sorry. There we go. All right. All right. What do we got? Okay. What do we got to uh, wrap it up? Fast rapid fire, Kalea vocal chain recording. SM7, well, for, uh, SM7, uh, Neve 1073, LA2A, done. Awesome. All right. And that was for Daniel Robert. And our last one is from Sunny Greenwich. Uh, hello from Ireland, Jakir. I love your work. Do you start your mixes the same way? Drums, vocals first or through a template? Thanks for your time. Um, yeah, I, I generally use a template of some sort and try to build one custom for each project or mix. You know, it's like with a start, with a starting template and then kind of uh, especially the mix bus, really get the mix bus selection of uh, things just just right for the right tonality of the outcome. And um, uh, oh, do what I start with. I kind of just start with a general balance of everything um, and kind of get a sense of it and some placement. And then um, yeah, then I, I, I typically then just go to the the drums really quickly and kind of do some forensic work there and try to understand it, um, if, especially if it's something I haven't recorded. And then just kind of build it from there. I, you got to get the, the bottom end to kind of be right. And then you can kind of stack stuff on top of it, but I try to do it as quickly as possible. Um, but yeah, to try to have an overall first listen. There it is. Ta-da. Yes. <laughs> Great. So well, fun. there you have it. <laughs> We've been on for a long time. Shakir, man, and you said that no one would want this many hours of you, and you were wrong because they do, and they're probably asking about too. a part three. But we're, <laughs> yeah, it'll happen. Um, so for uh, for people next week, um, we're doing a mixed tank takeover thing, so it'll be same time as normal. But I'll be listening to your mixes if you're a pure mix member and submit a mix. That's the way that works. And I'll say stupid shit after I listen. Awesome. Um, so that's what's going on. And then, uh, Last hold one's on. crazy. Let me see what else is going on. And then, uh, oh, and then uh, coming up next month, we got a couple of uh, a couple of slouches, really. Manny Markin and Daryl Thorpe. But whatever. We'll talk to them. <laughs> so that should be amazing. Shakir, thank you so much awesome. for all your time. This has been oh. absolutely amazing. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for your time, both of you. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute us and go to the thanks for watching screen, and then you have to FaceTime your your granddaughter. So yes. All right. We can. <laughs> Bye. See ya.